from his studios in New York. It's time for Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. Here's your host, Dan Tortora. Welcome here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Thank you for being with us this morning. I know we're uh, coming in here to you a little bit behind 9 a.m. this morning, and every single Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time, you can hear the show. We appreciate you tuning in to the broadcast every single Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time right here on MixLR.com backslash wake up call dt thank you so much for being a part of the show you can also connect with the show 24 7 by going to facebook at wake up call dt twitter at call dt and instagram at wake up call underscore dt and we thank you for everybody that connects with the show however you connect and whatever you're doing thank you so much for being a part of the broadcast let's jump in to the morning menu so that you can Get that feel, get that flavor, get that beat that I love, and then we will get into what's happening for today. Here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We like to start off the show by giving you our menu of topics. The morning menu, that is, live now with the morning menu is Dan Tortora. The morning menu right here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, proudly brought to you by all the amazing partners that we're very pleased to work with in the community, good, hardworking people that care about you, care about their products, care about their services, and doing things the right way every time. I want to thank everybody that is part of the Wake Up Call family. You can check them out on wakeupcalldt.com's homepage where it says Central New Yorkers support your local community. You can check them all out right there, and I want to show them some love, show that love where love is due, and let you know of these companies that we're very proud to work with and and be connected to. (laughs) And those being a very big thank you to Carvel DeWitt, Dry Sig Apparel, Dry Sig Lady, you can spell that D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G, Looking Glass Events, the Penn and Trophy Center, the Wildcat Sports Pub, Honda City of Liverpool, Giovanni's Tuxedos, Utica Pizza Company, FanHands.com, 315 Chiropractic and Wellness, LJ Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty, and of course Chick-fil-A. We want to thank you all for all that you do and for your connection to the show. We truly appreciate it. We thank you for being a part of the community and for all the good work that you do in the community. We thank you so much. So much appreciation. With that being said, let's jump into what's going on for today. We've got plenty of show coming your way in just a little bit here around 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be joined with a conversation you're not going to find anywhere else featuring Cam Lynch. Cam Lynch, the former linebacker for the Syracuse Orange who has spent time with the Los Angeles Rams, the St. Louis Rams, spent time with them in both cities and also with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's back with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They've put him onto the roster this season, going into OTAs and getting ready for the 2018-19 campaign. Very excited for him and very happy about his longevity in the NFL and, and, and just everything that Cam Lynch has been able to do. Positive spirits, positive vibes, positive mindset, and somebody that I really just appreciate their time. So he'll be on in just a little while to tell his story, and I can't wait to hear from him and spend some time with him here and in just a little while here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. After that, around 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time, I'll be joined by Lee Ross, the former Syracuse softball head coach who is always connected with the collegiate world and giving her thoughts and her feelings. She had made some statements recently about how it should be about the fun of the game or supporting the fun of the game and how things have changed with recruiting and and you know just going after players and how early they go after the players and not playing for the love of the game anymore but playing for the desire for money or playing for the desire for prowess or you know just to get a good scholarship but not not for the love of the game and not for ultimately why 
you got started in the sport itself in the first place. And, you know, that's, that's a near and dear thing to my heart because I've, you know, I've been around a bunch of kids that have played sports and they're like eight years old and whatnot. And the way that they're pushed, I understand, you know, to become a good player, but at the same time, it's, it's like the kid never gets an opportunity to be a kid, never gets an opportunity to love the game. And that to me is, is sad. You know, I want, I want people to appreciate and love what they do. And we had a conversation about that this week, you know, about why I do what I do and, and fight the fights I fight because I love my experiences and I love what I do and I, I love the world that I'm in. And as much as, you know, there's things that go on in this world, there's things that go on in any world. The thing is, you're going to meet a jerk wherever you go. So would you rather be doing what you love when you meet that jerk or would you rather be doing something that you can't stand and can't wait to get out of? So, I mean, that it's a pretty should be a pretty easy answer to that, you know. Do you do what you love and and take on the ridicule and take on people not understanding you or what you stand for and whatnot, or do you work in something that you can't possibly stand and go through the ridicule there? Because the fact of the matter is you're going to go through ridicule wherever you are. I'd rather be doing what I love around the people that I love and appreciate than doing something I kind of like sometimes, and that's where I meet the people that I'm not fond of. You're going to meet people that you're not fond of in every walk of life, no matter what you do. So let it be that you're doing something you love, being the person that you love to be. Love yourself in the mirror, love yourself inside and out, and be that person, you know, instead of pretending to be somebody else or do something else when you're trying to live your life. You know what I mean? It's I'd rather be myself and be ridiculed, do what I love and be ridiculed, than be somebody else and and not appreciate what I'm doing and and that's when I get ridiculed. You know, I wouldn't that doesn't that doesn't help. You know what I mean? And 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 that's it's not positive. So, do what you love, be the best self that you can be and enjoy what you got. And I'm very excited to have Lee Ross on the show because I know that when it comes to, you know, sports and, and knowing what's going on and appreciating and respecting, you know, other people and athletes and, and looking out for the best, you know, I know that, that Lee is, is one of those good hearts out there. So I'm happy to have her on the show in just a little while. Lee Ross will be joining me and we'll be continuing the college athletics conundrum and, and what's going on. So I can't wait to have her on the show. And then after that, we'll finish off the show with the Through the Looking Glass signature segment, proudly brought to you by Looking Glass Events. If you're looking to plan an event, the number to call is 315-702-4653. That is 315-702-4653. Kira Wasserback and her team at Looking Glass Events are looking to help you plan your event today. Do not wait. Do not hesitate. Let them help you out and let them help you plan your event the right way and to the best of their ability. We all need a team. We know it takes a village. So start by making that phone call for your event to 315-702-4653 and ask Kira Wasserback how we can get it set up to the best of the best it possibly can be. That's what I want. So definitely, definitely make that phone call and, and much appreciation to everybody that already has made that phone call to Kira Wasserback. When you're planning an event in central and upstate New York, the number to call is 315-702-4653. We'll take a deeper look at a trending topic coming up at 10 around 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time, rounding out the show. And as you know, it is all ad-libbed. So I look at the trending topics at the moment of the show, and then we discuss it from there. So very excited to do that with you. And with some time this morning here, we got a few minutes before we get into the conversation with Cam Lynch. So there's, you know, there's been <clears throat> a few things on my mind and things that have kind of just been sticking with me. And I, I want to get to a few of those things that, that have been on the cranium this morning here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. And, and one of those things is that you know, a guy has gotten to live his dream. He's the same age that I am, 32 years old, and he's waited a very, very, very long time to see his dream realized in the NBA, but it was finally realized recently here, and that's Andre Ingram. Andre Ingram being able to have his NBA debut and to have this opportunity to never give up on his dreams, 32 years old, and finally gets to play in the NBA, which was amazing 
So he came in this past Tuesday night, which was April 10th, signed with the Lakers for the final two games of the season. He spent more than a decade playing in the NBA's G League. And in his first game as an NBA player, he had 19 points on 6-for-8 shooting, 4-of-5 from three-point range. Amazing. 19 points, 6-for-8, including 4-for-5 from beyond the arc against the Rockets, was Andre Ingram in his first NBA game after spending more than 10 years working his way and trying to show what he can do in the NBA G League. Absolutely amazing. Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest Lakers of all time, made the statement, Dude, the story is ridiculous. Like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I mean, to have the courage and resolve to stick with that dream and to now get your shot and to come through in that way, I mean, that's impressive, man. That coming from Kobe Bryant to Andre Ingram. More than a decade of trying to get into the NBA, cracks the NBA, scores 19 points, phenomenal shooting percentages from inside the arc and beyond the arc, and then after the game, you have Kobe Bryant weighing in on how impressed he is with you? How can you write a better story, and how can you say that once God helped you kick that door down, that it wasn't one of the greatest moments, and worth every second, worth every blood, sweat, and tear moment that you had? To have the courage and resolve to stick with that dream. The courage and resolve. And I read a quote before. It's at Longhorn Steakhouse, actually. And it said, courage is not the absence of fear. It's being afraid and saddling up anyway. So this man saddled up for over a decade whether or not he was afraid. And he had the resolve to stick with it. And it's an amazing story. So Andre Ingram, I mean, you are one of the most heartwarming stories that I've seen in a while. And I love it. And I just want to thank you. And I appreciate you. And, you know, seeing people like you in the community do what you do and love how you love and and believe in yourself the way that you believe in yourself, that means the absolute world to me. So I really appreciate it. And, and it means it means so much. You know, I haven't met this guy, and I hope to God I, I meet him someday. Amazing. They were cheering MVP for him, the Lakers fans were, in this game. And he will get $13,824 for three days playing with the franchise. So almost $14,000. The Lakers fans cheering MVP. Kobe Bryant saying he's impressed by you after 10 years of fighting your butt off. This man, Andre Ingram, made night to put it into perspective, he made $19,000 for the entirety of his G League season. He will make $13,824 for three days. And you know what? I hope that this man keeps his job in the NBA. I hope that they sign him and that they realize that he is more than paid his dues. Luke Walton gave him the game ball after Tuesday. Luke Walton provided him with the game ball. Amazing. And, you know, it's, it's just... The Lakers put out a thing that said 10 years, hell of, an open, hell of an opening night. The game ball could only go to one person. Thank you for inspiring us all, Andre Ingram. These are the stories that I want to hear. These are the stories that I want trending on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. These are the stories I want to squeak through. Now, who knows what will squeak through on Facebook since... Their algorithms or whatever they want to call it ends up taking important positive messages off of our live feed and just leaves us with a bunch of people screaming about the election that happened a very long time ago. But, and that's the thing on this show, I don't care who you voted for. It's like enough. It's enough. 
I don't like going on Facebook and hearing people still talk about the election. Russia, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. It's so exhausting. Like, the people writing these things must literally, like, put an IV in their arm and slip into a coma after they write this because I'm exhausted reading it. I, I got to imagine that you're exhausted saying it. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning. It's like, here's the 10 reasons why I think the election is rigged. Go to bed! Who cares? I want stories about Andre Ingram. I want stories about that. I am upset that the color rush uniforms, FYI, are going away. Like the Jaguars gold uniform kind of look like Grey Poupon. But it's it's gone now. They're getting rid of the jerseys. However, the Jaguars are going to get more teal-related coming up here. So I'm excited about that opportunity. Glenn Rice's son, this is a sad story, Glenn Rice Jr. was released by his team in Israel after punching his teammate in the face. I would venture to say that that probably gets you sent off a team. Glenn Rice spent 15 years in the NBA. His son has played 16 games in two seasons with the Washington Wizards. He's also played in the G League. He was waived in 2015, and he went to Summer League. I covered him at Summer League. And and then, I mean, he had a DUI arrest. This is the thing. When you look at, like, kind of the trail of a player, he had a DUI in Georgia Tech and has had more problems since leaving the NBA. He had an arrest in 2016 for a robbery and in 2017 on battery charges. He was also shot in the leg in 2015. And now he's punched as someone on the his Israeli team in the face, and he's no longer part of the team. So... My best to you, Glenn Rice Jr., for getting getting the ish together and getting yourself better here and getting whatever help that you need because, I mean, man, that's just not, it's not healthy. Not healthy at all. And it's a trail of it. So my best to you and, and my hopes that you get better. There's been some hats that came out, ladies and gentlemen, for the draft for the NFL. You know, if you know me, I'm I'm pumped for the I love the NFL draft. I'm going to be doing a mock draft coming up here soon, and I can't wait for the NFL draft. Now, there's some they they're they're new type of hats. They're kind of old school looking hats, kind of like swedish looking hats, and I I feel like these are just designs and I hope they are. Because the letters are like crooked and spaced out weird. I mean, these these look like hats that were done rapidly in a very cheap manner. Like the letters are not all the same size. They're not all straight. They're not all like together. So I'm hoping that these are just pictures and not the actual hat. But there's some good ones. You know, Dallas says America's team and inside the hat it says them boys. The Niners faithful. Uh, Rise up Red Sea for the Arizona Cardinals. Kind of weird, though, because Moses parted the Red Sea. Or Jesus, or pardon me, God parted the Red Sea for Moses. So rise up, Red Sea, is like go against God and and not part the, I don't know. I would say part the Red Sea, but, I mean, that's just me. I like the Jaguars one. It says black and teal. That one's actually pretty cool. Uh, the Bills, Bill Leave, I like that one. Go Fins, and on the inside, hashtag Fins. Apparently there's nothing else to say about Miami. You know, fly, Eagles, fly. You kind of expect this, but it's weird because the Eagle logo is not in the center like the other ones. Broncos, country, united in orange. It's not bad. J-E-T-S. I like that for the Jets. We are Texans. That's okay. The dog pound one is actually really cool for the Cleveland Browns. But the thing is, it's just, it's kind of, you know, the Rams are mob squad. I don't I don't know if that would be my thing. Chargers, super chargers, it's okay. You know, two states, one team for Carolina. I like that. The inside of the hat says keep pounding. I don't know if that's the right verbiage, but <laughs> whatever you got to do. Play like a Raven is on the inside of the Ravens hat. Question is, what does that mean? But Ravens flock is not a bad thing to have out there. Colts forged. I, I don't I don't know if I'm a big fan of this one. I actually like the inside of the hat to be on the outside. It says horsepower. I like that one. Defend the North, Skull Vikes. I like Skull Vikes to be on the front of the hat, not on the inside. Hail to the Redskins, and on the inside, Hogs. Mm. Chiefs Kingdom, City of Fountains Football. 
don't know what that means. Tighten up. I think there's a better thing for that. I would actually, on the Titans hat, have Remember the Titans. That's what I would have done. Detroit, one Pride, defend the Den. Not bad. I'd maybe put Pride Rock. Or I'd put Our Kingdom and kind of play off the Lion King. I said I like the Dog Pound. Cincinnati, Who Day, ready to roar on the inside. I like that. New Orleans, I like Who Dat. Who Day and Who Dat. But they put Big Easy Football. I'm not a big fan of that. It's okay. Fire the Cannons. This is what I'm saying. When I'm looking at these logos, the C is like way off. The C looks like it's going to fall off the hat. I'm hoping that these hats don't look like this because they look like they were rushed. But Fire the Cannons, that's not bad. Go Pack Go. That makes sense. Title Town USA. I'd actually put that on the front of the hat, not on the inside. The Dirty Birds, I would have put that on the front of the hat, not on the inside. Mob Squad, mm, I don't like it. Not great connotations. Do your job for... For the Patriots, do your job. They'd be like, no, do your job, bro. Raiders, Raider Nation, just win, baby, on the inside. I like that. Steel City, Steel Curtain, not bad. Monsters of the Midway for the Chicago Bears, Windy City Football. It's not bad. I, I The Seattle one's awesome because it's all about the fans. It's the Seattle logo, and it says we are, and it's got the 12 with a flag on it. So we're the 12th man. You know, and I think that that's so cool that their quote is about their fans. It's not even about them. It's about their fans. Like we are, we are together. We are one. We are the twelfth man. You know, you guys, you guys help to make us what we are. Without you, we we can't fully be us. You know, that's like the biggest sign of respect to your fan base. So I think that that's really cool. So there's some good ideas. It's just that the hats look like. Like I said, that they were like put into production quickly and just kind of sent out there, and I hope everything works out type of feel. So I'm just hoping that, you know, the hats look better than they look on here because on here they look like there was a really good idea that was rushed out of produ- rushed into production. So hopefully they look nice. You know that I'm a, I'm a fan of draft hats. If you didn't know that, you know that now. And speaking of the draft, and speaking of opportunities, and speaking of the NFL, Cam Lynch is coming up in just a moment. Let's take a step aside for a fast break and get the man on the show. Cameron Lynch will be joining me, former Syracuse linebacker and current linebacker for that team that they call the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He joins me in just a moment here on Wake Up Call with Dan Satora. Make sure that you're listening in, and we are very, very excited, Cam, to have you back in just a few moments. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. Carvel DeWitt, it's what happy tastes like. Do you know why? Because we make ice cream. Creamy, rich, flavorful ice cream. Not yogurt or ice milk like some of our competitors. Ice cream. Fresh, by hand, daily. For the calorie conscious, we have something new for you. Our new Carvelite. Same great flavor, creaminess, and texture of our regular ice cream with only 35 calories an ounce. So whether you want an ice cream cake, flying saucer, dasher, carvelanche, hard or soft ice cream, we will satisfy your craving with our fresh, handmade, regular, or new Carvelite ice cream. Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. Clothing that will change with you without you having to change. DrysigLady.com, D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G, Lady.com. With the bamboo line, relaxed fit clothing, as well as the athletic fit clothing, DrysigLady.com is fit for any woman, any time of the day, anywhere. Whatever you're doing, whatever your day commands of you, Command yourself to feel comfortable in Dreisig Lady Apparel. D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Lady.com. For all the women out there, feel good in what you're wearing. And don't feel like you have to constantly change throughout the day. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, a business owner, going for a jog, going for a meeting, or just relaxing at home, DreisigLady.com is the right fit for you. D R E I S S I G Lady dot com. This is Lawrence Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty. Call our home office at 315-752-9513. Or better yet, call or text me directly at 315-748-2524. 
Let me ask you a question, Lawrence. If I needed you to help me buy a house, find the right place, could you help me do that? Joe, I'll help you find your dream home. You don't ever say my name on the radio, never. If I needed to sell a house, could you help me go about that the right way? Yes, yes I can. How do they get a hold of you? Call me directly at 315-748-2524. But you also do the commercial property. So if I got a business, couple businesses, got to take one here, move it over there, do this, do that. Are you going to help me buy and sell my commercial property also? Yes, sir. I like that. I like that. What's my name again? I have no idea. Absolutely. But they need to know your name, so give it one more time. This is Lawrence Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty. My phone number is 305-748-2524. Why don't you tell them your name one more time and that number so we can jot it down. This is Lawrence Papaleo. Call me or text me directly at 305-748-2524. Hi, this is Domenico Vitali, owner of Giovanni's Formalware, where you look great and feel even better with our renowned tailoring and alteration services on any suit or any tuxedo from anywhere. Call 315-455-8729. That's 315-455-8729. Stop in locally on Route 11 in North Syracuse next to the Ponderosa Plaza where you can choose your style, get fitted, and tailored, all at Giovanni's Formal Wear. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Always a pleasure to have the man on the show. That is Cameron Lynch. Cameron is no stranger to the broadcast. We have done shows on location in central New York, and we've talked, obviously, after games and going into games when he was playing at Syracuse. And since he joined the NFL ranks, we've kept in touch from there. So I appreciate him always having some time for me. And, and in having time for me, having time for you here on Wake Up Call with Dan Satora. So let's bring him in. Cam, how you doing today? Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, much love. I appreciate you, Syracuse fans. What's happening? And definitely happy to have you here on the show. So, you know, let the Syracuse fans know and, and everybody know kind of what's been going on with you, you know, how life has been. I mean, since let's let's go back to since you joined the NFL, just what things have been like for you and just what your journey's been like from the beginning when you joined the NFL. It's been a blessing so far. Um, every every offseason I get, I, I make sure that I do something to help push, push a career after football. Last my my rookie year, I went overseas, did this thing called Pro Tours, where we go or we hang out with troops. And in Singapore, did that my uh, did that my first two years. Last, uh, this year, went to Australia, did it there, and I just came from a broadcast boot camp. Each season has been great. Stayed healthy, knock on wood, and I plan on plan on staying healthy for the for the remainder. And everything's been great so far, Dan. I appreciate you, and uh, and I've been I've been rocking the orange ever since. Uh, my teammates I play against, I make sure that they know that I went there. Anytime I get on air with anything, whether it be a Players Tribune or anything like that, I'm tweeting out Syracuse Orange. So uh, it's it's much love from over here. And you know, and to have that connection and and to have that love for Syracuse, just just what you can say about you know why. It's meant so much to you over the years. I mean, some people, you know, they appreciate their experience in college. Some kind of want to just move on and, and go forward. What is it about Syracuse that makes you still want to connect with them, even though, you know, obviously the coaching staff is different from head coach down and, and the scheming is different, the defense is different and whatnot than what you had. But what keeps you connected to the program? Our Syracuse alumni base is, is so huge. Even in Florida and out in Tampa where I'm at now, where we link up with people, out there who are Syracuse alum, Jeremy Wilkes, he lives in my same neighborhood. So we just, I, I bleed orange everywhere I go. Uh, even in New York, when I go to New York City, I go to events or I do anything social media based or when I want, I want to get into broadcasting and whatnot. So in that arena, there's a lot of Syracuse alum. I hear at the broadcast boot camp in Ohio, there were some Syracuse alum representing there from that work at ESPN on air. So I met a lot of people in from Syracuse in the industry and throughout football that went that went to Syracuse and bleed orange as well. And when you have that connection, I, I know, like you said, you want to get into broadcasting, and and you you did something at Syracuse called Cam's Cam. Have you tried to keep that up in in any, in in some way, you know, some way, shape, or form? Is there something that you do to kind of keeps you in it right now? 
most definitely on my Instagram Instagram profile pic. I actually have a, a graphic up, and it's Cam's Cam, really. And I just started going live on Instagram, start posting. So I'm gonna build up, build up a rapport, man, and build up an identity for Cam's Cam, and, and keep it going, keep it flowing. Show that I bleed orange, and and it's something I want to do. And I got in in my profile picture on Instagram, it's a it's a blue and orange jersey. So representing the Syracuse love. So it's all love here, and, and, and it, through the rest of my career, I'll be pushing it. So. Um, yeah, you can, you can look out for it uh, on Instagram, uh, Twitter. I'll be hashtagging those things. So just to push that cam to cam aspect and that uh, that orange aspect. And and to look at that, you know, look at that connection. Speaking here with Cam Lynch, a former linebacker of Syracuse that is in the NFL and and keeping that NFL dream going and keep it alive and keep it rolling. You know, you've had an experience, Cam, and in your time, you know, you got to spend some time with Saint with the St. Louis Rams before the Rams went over to. LA and then had some times some time with Tampa Bay and then we're, we're out in LA with the Rams and then back to Tampa and and still continuing on here with Tampa these two franchises just what you could say about your experience with the Rams so far and your experience with with the Bucks as well it's been great it, fe- it feels like two parents essentially right uh, the two parents that are divorced uh, essentially you have one parent over here on the west coast one parent here over here on the east coast one parent that's blue one parent that's red so it's been pretty great um, to be able to go back in between both and have that, the rapport between each, build those relationships, those friendships. Um, and it's, it's been pretty awesome. I also have the family in Syracuse as well. Um, so it's just like a big, a big family. Everybody knows each other. Um, and, and you just never know whenever you're going to end up back with the Rams or back with Tampa. But right now I'm with Tampa and we plan on going pretty far, winning, winning a Super Bowl, man. We, we got a, we got a taste of it at the Rams last year, going to the playoffs towards the end of the season. Um, and now, now back with Tampa. So uh, I essentially plan on we we plan on Tampa Bay Buccaneers plan on going to the playoffs and making a run for the for the championship. And when you look back at at the Rams, you know I went down to St. Louis for the NCAA tournament in 2016. And to see Syracuse uh, in the round of 64, round of 32, covering them and everybody else that was there. And when you went by the arena that the Rams had played in, the banners were still up. The pictures were still up. The logo was still up. There was signs and whatnot. I said it's almost like when your girlfriend breaks up with you or boyfriend, whatever it may be, your your significant other breaks up with you, and and you're doing your thing and living your life, and you guys share an apartment together. So even though you're broken up, you know they still have a, a box of stuff in your apartment. That's what it felt like when I drove by the the Rams Arena in St. Louis. It was like you're already broken up with your girlfriend, but she left a box at the house, and she'll come pick it up eventually. I mean, how strange was that to be the be a part of an organization? Because this doesn't happen often. That you know you're you're part of the Rams in St. Louis, and then they tell. I mean, getting traded is one thing, and saying, "Hey, Cam, you're leaving St. Louis, and you're going to Seattle." You're going to Dallas, you're going to New York, but when the Rams are like, hey, you're still a part of the organization, but we're moving to California. I mean, just what that experience was like for you. It was pretty special. I'm uh, from California, born there, so it was nice to to go back, go back home, and like you said, uh, there's, a, there's a leftover box in St. Louis, and there's always, there's memories, there's, there's you spend time in St. Louis, you spend time with the next girlfriend, essentially, so there's always good memories there, uh, and it's all love with the St. Louis fans as well. Like I said, my first year there, uh, they show love there, and I met great people out in St. Louis. So there's always going to be love. You never know where people or guys are going to be on the team, right? I'm with Tampa Bay, but I always show love to the St. Louis fans, even the fans in L.A. So it's it's all love, man. If you treat people with respect and treat your city with respect, and they'll, they'll give it back. So, yeah, like I said, it's all, all love there. Being part of the Rams organization, did you get a sense that uh, that, that, that team was – trending upward i mean jeff fisher's that the head coach for a little bit and you know obviously he has had success and been able to bring a team to the super bowl and then you know going to the la rams it just wasn't working out things just weren't happening and then sean mcveigh takes over i think he's like a year older than me and you know he takes over the team with a lot of the same players and gets more out of them than Jeff Fisher. I mean, I would say, you know, more than 50% improvement out of these guys and, and out of the team as a whole. Todd Gurley looked like himself again. And, you know, the Rams caused some fits for a lot of a lot of people, a lot of teams out there. Did you get a sense of that? Did you see that building? And, and when there was a coaching shift, 
did it did it happen right away? Was it systematic? Just what do you, what can you say about being a part of the Rams organization that went from insignificant to a team that not only was effective this past season, but made a lot of moves this off season to be relevant and be one of those teams that's vying for an opportunity to be playing late in January, maybe even February. It was pretty great. It was great, pretty great to see and be a part of essentially to leave and come back to something that was, that was pretty special. Like you said, playoff run. I got to go you know, be a part of a playoff team, uh, win the NFC West championship. So that was pretty, pretty sick doing that. I plan on, we plan on doing it here at Tampa Bay as well. Right. Last year we didn't have too much success, but but this year we plan on going going and kinda of doing the same thing the Rams did. Just finding finding our niche, finding our zone and winning some games. We we have a lot of great players here at Tampa Bay and we plan on, like I said, making a run in the playoffs and, and contending for a championship. Speaking here with Cam Lynch, a former Syracuse linebacker and currently uh, in the NFL with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And like you said, you know, speaking on the, the Rams and their history, but you're back in Tampa. This is the the you know a second time around another go around for you with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So what can you say about how everything came about? Bring me into it. What did the what did the agent hear? How did it happen? When did it happen that Tampa Bay said, "Hey, remember that guy Cam Lynch? I think we should give him a call." Oh yeah, just after the season, they even even when I was let go from from Tampa Bay, they still wanted me to come back. So I just want to explore my options as well. And I saw the Rams were available, and I, I took that option. After I came from the Rams in Tampa Bay, I was like, "Hey, we still want you back here." And I was like, "Okay, I'll come back. I'll come back, Mom or Dad." So it was a <laughs> it was a it was a nice experience to be able to have that option for employment. So so I enjoy it a lot, and I have much much appreciation to the Tampa Bay organization allowing me to call that place home again. So I will report your OTAs on Monday, and I look forward to, to getting to work. And and having this opportunity with Tampa the second time around, I mean, what do you remember about Tampa the first time around? What did you take away from the experience? What makes you excited about coming back? What makes me excited about coming back are the guys that I play with, the Quan Alexanders, the Bonte, David, and the and the other guys there as well. Um, a lot of chemistry with the linebackers there. It feels like a family, and I can't wait to go to war with those guys. So it'll be great with that hot Tampa sun, some some nice beaches, and, and some get some good work put in uh, out there in Tampa Bay. And, and, and with being back in Tampa, just what you could say about the fan base and the experience that you had out there, just what you're looking forward to to be back with them again. The Tampa Bay fans are, are, in, are love. They show a lot of love. They're, they go crazy for, for our team, especially when we win games. Even when we don't win games. So we plan on winning a lot of games and hopefully, hopefully being a championship to Tampa Bay, the Tampa Bay community. And you know, being a being a part of this team, you know, Jameis Winston and and some of these some of these other guys. I mean, obviously, what what this team can bring forward and and what the Buccaneers can do. You know, there's there's some talent on this team, and and I know that I know that they've struggled. I know that they were the only team out of the NFC South that didn't make the playoffs last season. How does that change? And and you know, what what can you say about your belief and and what this team has and your belief that they could turn the corner this year? We have a lot of talent. Um, if you guys watched Hard Knocks last year, you can see that we have a lot of talent on our team, offense, defensively, and special teams wise. So we plan on, like I said, making a run. Any team in the NFC, what, NFC in our division, we can we can hold the candle to or and or beat. So uh, we plan on making the playoffs this year. Like I said, making a run in the championship. That coming from Cam Lynch and Cam going back to Syracuse. How much do you get involved with everything? How much are you watching? How much of the Dino Dino Babers era have you seen up to this point? I've seen a lot. Even when uh, when Syracuse beat Clemson, I was watching the game on the on the flight going to going to play an opponent in, uh, in Tampa Bay. So watching that and seeing that, seeing the the change of culture at, at Syracuse was, was pretty awesome. Kind of felt like. I dug my own days. We were playing in Texas Bowl and the Finish Line Bowl, so it felt great. And and to have that experience to uh, to be able to you know watch the team and see what they've done under Dino, they've had you know back to back four and eight records, two and six in the ACC, two and two in non conference play. Yet in the last two seasons, they've beaten a top twenty opponent in the Carrier Dome both times. In 2016, they defeated Virginia Tech, who was in the top 20. That team went on to play in the ACC championship game and almost take down Clemson. 
And then last year, 2017, they took down Clemson, the reigning national champion, who was ranked number two in the nation at the time and did not have a loss. Just what you could say about those victories and, and what Syracuse is doing in the here and now that they haven't done in a really long time. Syracuse is doing a great job just, just competing. they creating a great culture, and I love you know Babers for it. And I look forward to this season, you know, him pushing our guys to, to win some football games. So as a Syracuse alum and a guy who bleeds orange, I can't wait. Tampa Bay, uh, like I told you, you know, I've covered the NFL for 15 years as a broadcaster and as a writer, and I uh, spent a lot of time in that northern part of Florida with the Jacksonville Jaguars. This will be my decade season of being around there. I've also spent, spent some time in the Tampa Bay digs and whatnot, so not going to be too far away from you and, and your opportunities that you have there. Just you know, speak with me about what you've learned as a player and just what you're taking into this season. I'm excited about you sticking around in Tampa, me having an excuse to, to travel down to Tampa for a little bit. So just what you could say about what you've taken away from it so far and, and what you've learned about yourself as you continue this dream in the NFL. It, you find yourself outside of football, outside of just playing. You you can hey, you, you can see that you're not just a football player. You can do more than that. So I'm out here at broadcast boot camp now, doing internships, players tribune, and other other places of such sort to build my brand outside of just football. So I've learned a lot in that aspect, and there's more to life outside of football. Building in football and outside of football is what I focus on. And and how have you built your brand? I know you talked about some different things that you've done, but just what you could say about branding yourself, because Cam, you, you you've always been an intelligent young man who's you know obviously grown over time here. But you know some guys have that short sightedness of I'm a professional athlete. I'm going to be a professional athlete forever. I'm always going to be here. My body's always going to hold up. Everything's going to be great. Where you know eventually football is going to end as a player, so you're trying to set yourself up brand yourself so that people buy cam lynch and not just cam lynch the football player bring me into that because i think that that's something that you know everybody needs to hear especially athletes need to hear most definitely it's important that you do things outside of football find your passion do what you love whether it be music whether it be food or blogging or whatever it is mine is being in front of the camera producing great content showing the athletes don't just shut up and dribble that we do more than just that so I plan on doing that. Look out on social media and other platforms to show that I'm out doing internships and I'm doing other things that people in my in my business aren't doing. And some guys, a lot of guys are doing. So you know, when I do run into those guys, I love to show them love and, and put them on. So um, I'm looking forward to the opportunities uh, that the future holds. And, you know, anything else in closing here, Cam, that, that you want to say? I mean, it's been a little bit since we've spoken. I know that you're getting into, you know, some off-season training, you know, OTAs and whatnot. Just what else is on your mind? What's what's kind of, you know, sitting with you right now? Because I think it's important for people to know, you know, more about you and more about what's going on and, and more about your story. So what would you like to share that we haven't discussed up to this point? I like to share, uh, just keep chasing your dreams and find multiple avenues. They say billionaires have seven sources of income, so find those sources, find what you love, and, and find a way to make a living off of it, whether it be sports, whether it be you know, acting or anything that you want to do, but find multiple sources, like I said, whether it be blogging or video gaming, find what you love, find a couple different ways to do it, and go for it. Like I said, football isn't my only option, my only stop. I plan on doing some broadcasts and doing some, putting out great content to hopefully become very successful and support my family and, and create great friendships and and use use a moral compass along the way as well. And it's all about learning about, like you said, building your brand. You know, I've done that for 15 years and counting. I respect what you've done to build your brand as well. So there's something that I like to do on the show, and I'd like to do this in closing with you, Cam, which is something that I believe we might have played in the past, but I want to do an updated version if we have, and that's Rapid Fire. It's a segment that's been a signature and a staple of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, and before that, the Dan Tortora Show for years. So I want to uh, to do that with you. I'm going to ask you five questions, then you can throw five my way. Are you ready to play? Ready to play. All right, sweet. So I will start off with my five. So if you could be any superhero in in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, who would you be and why? 
uh, with Black Panther because of the movement is crazy. I saw it two or three times. Uh, I took a picture with Chadwick as well. Three or six years alone, she hooked it up, and that's why I want to be Black Panther. So you told me that you got to take you got to take a picture with Chadwick Chadwick Boseman. Bring me into that a little bit. It was pretty cool. Through a Syracuse alum, Lisa, who works at Player Tribune, put us in touch. She knows his publicist. We ended up eating in New York City at the same spot and took a picture together. So that was that was pretty special. Well, that's great. You got to tell Lisa that she's got to hook me up too. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Most definitely. So and so, a little known fact, or I mean, I, I've said it before, but I have the Black Panther on my keychain and the way that my car is designed it's black with like a steel trim and it kind of looks like his mask so my car is nicknamed the black panther because of the movie and because of the character that i've liked for a few years leading up to the movie so just so you know i mean if he needs to know if we need something to sell this thing my car is called the black panther nice 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 so if you were be a, a superhero a marvel a marvel superhero who would you be if I was a Marvel superhero, I won't pick the same. I do love the Black Panther, but for sake of uh, for being a little bit different here, I'm going to go with my childhood favorite that I've loved since I was, I don't even know, a toddler, and that would be Spider-Man. He would he would 100% be mine. Okay, so he's Spidey senses attacked and everything like that. That's, that's a good pick. Yeah, okay, so, so definitely Spidey senses are ready to go. And uh, my second question for you in rapid fire would be, if you could change one thing about the world right now, what would it be? I would say the concept of uh, shut up and dribble. we got to change that. I plan on helping change that. So that's one of the things is the shut up and dribble aspect. So uh, if I could change anything, it would be that. All right, perfect. What's your What's your second question for me? If, if you had to change anything in the world, <laughs> <laughs> what would you change? If I could change anything in the world, I would change uh, kind of where we're at right now. I really, you know, I, I do take to heart when they say, if you don't understand and respect your history, you're, you're doomed to repeat it again. And I think that, unfortunately, uh, we have repeated our history. <clears throat> I think that, you know, we have, <clears throat> for some sad reason in life, uh, as a country, we have been a part of, you know, disbanding and not joining together with one another. I think that, you know, uh, difference between uh, male or female in the workplace needs to go away. I think that the difference of color or background, nationality, language, uh, how much money you make, I, I don't feel like we should be separated. You know, there's a reason why God made us all laugh the same, cry the same. We show we love each other by hugging each other, by kissing each other. You know, we, we, we have this, the, the, the core of who we are and how we show our emotion is all the same. And I think that, you know, God gave us a test and he said, okay, you're going to be different colors. I'm going to spread you out all across this world and I'm going to see how you interact with one another. Unfortunately, I don't think that everybody interacts like you and I do, Cam. So I would like to see the world change in that respect. Yes, that's a good regard there. Um, equal pay was National Equal Pay Day was the other day. So that's a big thing, too, creating that equal balance between men and women in the workplace. So I agree with that. The, the social infrastructure it does love and does need to change. And I look forward to that change, spreading love and the content that we create. Absolutely. And my, my third for you is... If you and I were to do a show together as broadcasters, what would you call it? The Dan and Cam Show. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. Listen, it rolls off the tongue, and you were ready for that one, so I feel like I feel like maybe that's been on your mind before, Cam. I, th I think maybe it's been there somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's automatic, man. It's automatic. Uh, what would you call a show if we had one as well? You, you can't call it the Cam or Dan and Show. Uh, okay, if I, if I can't call it the Dan and Cam Show, which I like, that you came up with. If you and I did a show together, what would I call it? Hmm, let me think about this. What would I call our show? I, I would say, I think I would call it, I think it would call, I, I would call our show Lower the Boom because there's a boom mic and what, and with you being a heavy hitter and being a linebacker, I think I would call the show Lower the Boom with Dan and Cam. I like that. I like that a lot, Dan. That's, that's like a great idea. We can probably do it in the future. <laughs> Yeah, so lower the boom would be that. Uh, my 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 fourth question for you would be if let me think here. If you could change anything about history, 
in the okay if you okay how about this let me let me think about this if you could change anything about the history of social media with everything going on now i mean it's front and center if you could change anything about social media what would it be the dialogue between athletes and fans i want to change that i want to help improve that so you know, once once we can get a, a mutual understanding of athletes and fans or music artists and fans uh, there won't be a, such a great disconnect. So hopefully we can create that that, co- that cohesion between the fan and um, an athlete connection through social media. All right, fair enough. What's your what's your fourth one for me? If you had to change anything on a Friday's menu, what would you what would you change? If I had to change. Oh, you love you love T what T G I Friday? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, if I'm here now, if you change anything on the menu. Which is there's two good options: fried shrimp, system chicken and cheese, Parmesan crusted chicken, crispy chicken fingers. Uh, what would you add, or what would you change? Okay, if I could add anything to a Friday's menu, I would add I would add the uh, I would add Tortora's famous nachos because everywhere I go, outside of a couple places in 32 years of my existence, I can never find nachos that I feel like were like worth the pay. I mean, it's very hard to find. So I started making homemade ones and I make homemade guacamole and I just fell in love with everything. So if I could change anything, I'd have Fridays add my nachos to the menu. Wow, I would eat those. I'd actually order those right now. <laughs> what are you going to get? You know what you're getting? I'll probably get some chicken fingers, keep it simple. I'll hop on the plane pretty soon. So I'll get some chicken fingers and get some chicken fingers and probably a nice cold glass of water keep it going. All right, fair enough. So my final question for you, Cam, is hmm, if you if you walked if any everywhere you went, everywhere you walked, everybody could see this. There was there's going to be a neon sign above your head with a speech bubble. What would that what would what would be the statement inside of that speech bubble? It would say, let's go. <laughs> Say, let's go. <laughs> awesome. So. I, I love how you're you're sitting at the restaurant, so you're being very like you're like, let's go. Well you really want to be like, let's go. <laughs> All right, exactly. I have to maintain a professional manner essentially after Friday. Yeah, I understand. I get you. So what's your final question for me in rapid fire? Final question for you. If you could drive any car in the world, what kind of car would it be? Man, I would drive the DeLorean because I want some back to the future action. Yeah, I'd, ha- I'd have the doors popping up. I'd be able to, you know, pour some soda in my gas tank and, and fill up my car so I don't have to worry about paying for gas anymore. Wouldn't be hurting the environment anymore. And, you know, I could hang out with Doc and McFly, so I'd be good with that. That's not that's not a bad car to ride in, my man. That sounds like a plan right like there. Yeah, absolutely. So that coming from Cam Lynch once again. Cam, don't be a stranger. I know things get busy with camp and OTAs and, and whatnot, but keep in touch with me, and, and I will do the same with you and, and I thank you for being a part of that over the years and I thank I thank you for the mutual respect because on this side of the mic, you know, I, I reach out to, you know, you athletes and, and student athletes and, and professional athletes all over the world and want to tell your story and want to continue to tell your story. But when you reach back out to me and, and there's that mutual respect, it's it's what reminds me that what I'm doing in this world and, and daring to be different is is being seen and being appreciated so i want to thank you for that thank you dan for you have allowed me to reach out to the syracuse alum and this is much love i'm on fridays right now but it wasn't that i got a chance to talk to the people and tell people what i'm what i have going on absolutely well we appreciate having you here and i look forward to talking with you soon thank you dan appreciate you my man all right man take care all right take care this is a wake-up call, Fast Break. This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that uh, positively impacting the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily. You know, we bring in local produce. We prepare to order in the kitchen. We hand bread our chicken. We hand spin our milkshakes. It's 
it's great food. It doesn't taste like fast food. I, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. It's different. We we try to treat people with intentional kindness here, which is very different and deeper than good customer service. And so, you know, I think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. And then lastly, the impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick Fil A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do is to shine a little light in their life, that's a very very different experience uh, than you will have in any other quick service restaurant, and it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. Hi, this is Domenico Vitali, owner of Giovanni's Formalwear, where you look great and feel even better with our renowned tailoring and alteration services on any suit or any tuxedo from anywhere. Call 315-455-8729. That's 315-455-8729. Stop in locally on Route 11 in North Syracuse next to the Ponderosa Plaza where you can choose your style, get fitted, and tailored, all at Giovanni's Formal Wear. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice from buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. It would be a pity if you don't shop. For all of us that have always wanted our favorite restaurant to come to us, it's now a reality in Central New York with It's a Utica Thing, with Utica Pizza Company bringing their wonderful recipes that they've handed down through generations to you, to your events, to your business, to your home. It's a Utica Thing, proudly bringing Utica Pizza Company on wheels to your location. Call 315-738-8946. That's 315-738-8946 to bring Utica Pizza Company to your doorstep with It's a Utica Thing. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Want to show some love and some thanks to Cam Lynch for being a part of the show today. You know I appreciate you, Cam. So thank you for all that you do, and and thank you for being a a part of the broadcast. He is somebody who, I mean, from pregame to postgame, to during the week when he was at Syracuse, to after the season, to doing a live show on site in the community. I mean, we've gotten to do so much together. So I just appreciate it very much, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, he always finds some time to come on to the show. So thank you, Cam, for being a part of this broadcast and being a part of Wake Up Call and and wanting to to co-host and do some things together i think you know that's that's a that's a huge compliment brother i appreciate it very much so means a lot to me and i thank you for that in just a few minutes i'm going to be joined by lee ross lee ross the former syracuse softball head coach she will be joining me around 10 15 a.m eastern time today and we're going to be talking about collegiate athletics and just where things are at and maybe where they need to be and just what Lee Ross has taken away from the state of collegiate athletics, playing for the fun of the game, what social media has done to the game, and what matters ultimately overall. So we're gonna we're gonna discuss a little bit of everything coming up here in, in just a little while with Lee Ross because I always appreciate her time, I appreciate her honesty and her openness, and I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to have her back on the show because it's been a while. So I look forward to bringing her back onto the air and and she'll be with me in just a little bit here and we're very much looking forward to that in just a few minutes here on wake up call with dan Tutora to 
get Lee Ross on the broadcast, and, and she will be, like I said, discussing the state of collegiate athletics and where things are at right now, where she would like to see things go, how much things have changed, and so much more. So Lee will be joining us and, and bringing a great, great uh, angle to the conversation. And, you know, I look forward to it because I feel that, you know, when it comes to the <clears throat> college model and what things have become, you know, things have changed a lot, even just in my three decades on this earth. It's been a lot of change when it comes to collegiate athletics. It's It's been for the love of the game. It's It's been to, you know, to grow and advance and an opportunity would be great. And I'm so humbled in this. And I, I love this no matter what, you know, to, to just this. Okay, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I only have to go to class for this much time. And then I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get the money. I'm going to keep moving on. Da, 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 da. It, it's become different. When somebody goes up to a 12-year-old and says, hey, I think that you'll be a great quarterback in six years. Can we offer you a scholarship? And it's like, are you insane? I mean, yeah, there's going to be those those wonders and whatnot. But the way that recruiting goes on now and... I mean, I'm just thinking about it from the parent's point of view. If I had a kid that was playing basketball, girl or guy, doesn't matter. I have a son or daughter playing basketball. There's AAU in their ears. There's high schools in their ears. There's agents that are snooping around in their ears. There's this. I mean, there's so many people trying to get to them. You know, they, they have, and I'm not saying that they're all bad. I know good AAU people. I know good coaches in the professional ranks and the collegiate ranks. I'm not saying that it's all bad. I'm saying there's all of these people, and I know good agents. There's people that are all around them all the time, though. You know, and I just think about getting phone calls at the house at 8 o'clock at night, and my daughter's 14 years old, and I want her to go out and play and hang out with her friends and talk on the phone and have a good time. And she's on the, you know, she, and she's on the phone describe. And I, I mean, when I say talk on the phone, like talk to her girlfriends and this, that, and the other thing, she's on the phone with a coach answering questions like, where do you think you'll be in 20 years? And what about this? What about that? And yeah, it's a great opportunity. It's a, there's two sides to the sword. You know, my daughter at 14 years old getting looked at by AAU and, and colleges and this, that, I mean, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, and that could you know set her up for the rest of her life. At the same time, it's the other side of it. The you're never away from it. The you need to be playing basketball every single second of your life, or else because you need to prove to us and show us that this is what you want. Do you really want this? And you know to take away somebody's childhood, I think is wrong. And I defend that. I def I don't know Michael Jackson. I never met Michael Jackson, but I defend him all the time when I say you know he was a kid in a man's body because he was never allowed to be a kid. So in my opinion, I don't know what he did in his own home and this, that, and the other thing. And I would venture to say to parents, why did you let your children sleep over at a stranger's house unless you were looking for money or prowess or something like that? But, you know, ultimately, I... And I'm not saying it's the parents' fault if anything happened. I'm just saying I don't... I wouldn't drop my kid off to stay with a singer and be like, have a good time, love you, mean it. I, I just wouldn't do that. But that's me. That that would be my parenting. But at the same time, you know, we look at, I just look at the fact that I feel like he never got to be a kid. You know, yeah, he had a great life and he made a ton of money, but obviously he wasn't happy. He's not here right now. You know what I mean? So there's a double-edged sword to fame. You can't lose yourself. That's the biggest part of, of becoming famous at being an entertainer. You can't lose yourself. You can't lose who you are. You can't lose what you stand for, what, what you're about, and what got you started in the first place. If you're just in it for the money and in it for the prowess, you're in it for the wrong reasons. You can't be in it for that. you got to be in it for the love of it, for the desire and the appreciation of it. And when it comes to collegiate athletics now, it's just a constant... It's just, it never goes away. It never, ever goes away. And yeah, it, it breeds some pretty phenomenal players, but it also prevents people from being able to have a normal childhood and a normal life. And I've seen that happen, and that makes me sad. So I'm excited to have Lee Ross on the line to discuss the angles of it all and, and what she takes away from it. And, and if she feels like the love of the game has gone away and 
just how she sees things happening in our culture and in our society and what social media has done to all of that and how, I mean, she's been a coach and, and now, you know, she can, you know, she's still coaching out in the Midwest, but at the same time, you know, she's a parent too, and she can see both angles. So I'm just interested in getting Lee's thoughts and just what's on her mind about all this, because like I said, I always appreciate her time. So she's coming on the show here right after this fast break. Get ready to have a great conversation about college athletics, our kids, and the future of sports. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. Gear up with the real deal at Drysig Apparel. Creating what people are going to see and learn about you before they even meet you. Gear up for what you need for your team, business, or event. So look professional, look good, and feel good. Outfit yourself at DrysigApparel.com. That's D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Apparel.com. The only place to gear up with the real deal. Unica Pizza Company spells family, your family, my family, their family. The recipes that they have shared with each other throughout the years and have now been so gracious to share them with us. I can sit here and talk with you about all the great things that are on the menu. We'd be here forever. So let me say this. Utica Pizza Company is second to none. And now you can bring it home with you and you can dine in in the restaurant. UticaPizzaCompany.com will give you all the information that you need. And let me say, these Utica Greens, they're the best. Utica Pizza Company. Call them and place your order at 315-214-3060. That's 315-214-3060. Families break bread at Utica Pizza Company. What's the universal language of a fan? Clapping your hands. With Fan Hands, the ultimate sports fan accessory, find your team color, slip them on, and start cheering on your favorite team with 11 different colors always in stock on FanHands.com, where you'll find the ultimate sports fan accessory. Real fans wear Fan Hands. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice from buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. It would be a pity if you don't shop. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash DT. Very happy to have you here on to the show this morning and every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We are here with you on all your devices, everything that's got the internet, so desktop, laptop, or whatever you're carrying around or bringing in your pocket, we appreciate you listening in to the show, and very happy at this point in the show to bring Lee Ross back uh, Lee was no stranger to the broadcast when she was here in Syracuse as the softball head coach for the team at the university, and it's been way too long since we've had her back, so we need to make this more of a habit and get her back on here more often, but I'm happy to have her here today and happy to have this conversation on collegiate athletics. So with that being said, let's bring Lee in. Lee, how you doing today? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and Lee, you we were talking about it off the air You've moved out to to Indianapolis, and I mean, you 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 have this you have different weather. I know that it's not always warm, but it's more pleasant. How has life been since you have transitioned from Syracuse out to the Midwest? Well, first, I have to say that I miss Syracuse a lot. I I, I love the people, and and believe it or not, my husband thinks I'm crazy. I didn't mind the winters there. It's just how long they drug on was the only problem. And I think that's probably the only difference, you know. Here it's a little bit it's a little bit um milder, I guess, but the the winters don't seem to last as long and um be as serious as they were in Syracuse, but it's been great. I'm from the Midwest, so it's kind of like coming back home. Um and to be an in indie puts me a little bit closer to my family. So, it's been great. 
And uh, and your your husband Dan Dakich out out there and and Indy just just what life has been like for him. I know that he's a character. I had the opportunity to to be around him when he came into Syracuse a few years back. So it was nice to to see him. What's what's life like with with Mister Dakich? Because I know that he doesn't pull any punches and he has some fun. Absolutely, and you know every day is an adventure. You never know what you're going to get. I think that. <laughs> Um, well, and I think that's what life is about. You know, I think that you have to, to kind of keep it fun. And Dan's always up for anything that's, that's different and exciting. And, you know, he's, he's was super busy this, this year with, um, ESPN and he just, he had a lot of calls. He, he started way back on, went to Hawaii to do the tournament, the Maui Invitational and, and hasn't really stopped until last week, you know, the final four. So it was he's very busy but we find time to kind of have fun and and again you know like i don't know from day to day what he's going to do on twitter what's going to happen what kind of fight are we on on twitter um you know uh he's traveling here and there but now that his season has just ended mine's picking up i've been doing some games with espn so now he's back home and now i'm out on the road and, and, you know, what, what is that like? Because, you know, I talk to people all the time about, they're like, you know, your, your wife must be very, very sweet and very kind and very understanding because, you know, it's like I said, when you, when you're on the road for the tournament and for the uh, conference tournament time championship week into the NCAA tournament, I was home for five days and three weeks. And so they, they say, you know, that you're not a coach, but it's kind of a coach lifestyle and your wife gets it and she's supportive and, and that must be nice. So, I mean, I live there and I appreciate it, but I know that it's hard sometimes to, you know, especially during certain parts of the season to, to take that time and sit down and, and relax. So how do you guys navigate through the fact that, like you said, this was your, this is your busy time and he's coming off of his busy time. So it, it obviously, you know, can be challenging. And I think both of us have coached for a majority of our life. I mean, in, in our schedules have been either athletes or coaches for our entire life. And that's just kind of part of the game so you expect that and we it it really isn't doesn't seem like a big deal I feel like for coaches or for people that are involved in athletics it's it's a lot of weird hours and it's time consuming but it's weird hours but if you've only known that then you're used to it so I think you know that's kind of the way that we handle it we we get it we always you're you're on the road you come back and okay I'm back right now I take care of stuff around home and now I'm back on the road again Mm -hmm. but it's just I, I honestly think that to be with someone who's in athletics, you just have to kind of understand that that's that's what it takes. The, the hours are weird, and there are so many, you know, different – all the different professions in, involved in athletics. You know, the coaches and the traveling, the trainers, um, the strength coaches, you know, the administrators, they all have different types of hours, but they're all usually very weird hours. And mm-hmm. it, it is a family thing. It becomes a family thing. Like, that's what your life is. My children have only known me as a college softball coach or, you know, so that's just what we've always done. It's never been an issue. And I think, um, you know, that's just, it, it's probably why Dan and I are together. Cause <laughs> we're just, you know, that's just who we are. We get each other. We get it. Yeah. You understand it. And, and speaking here with, with Lee Ross Dockich here this morning and, and, and Lee, I want to, I want to uh, get into one thing before we jump into collegiate athletics. I got to ask you about it because I'm all about taking something that's negative and redistributing it out to the world in a positive way. Kind of taking, you know, somebody spits in your face and then taking it and turning it into a flower and sending the flower back. And you hit, <laughs> you have a shirt that says Fire Dockage, so I got to ask you about that. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of a joke. Um, Michigan State had a little bit of an issue with Dan a couple times last season. and Not just Michigan. It always seems like wherever he goes, half of the place loves him and the other half hates him. It's just the way that it is. So he kind of embraces that and loves it. You know, it's just part of the game. And and everyone's so competitive and loyal to their team that, it, you know, it's just whatever's said in the moment is just said in the moment. You just get over it. But the fire docket shirts was something that um, I saw on Twitter one that one day and I decided I need to have one of those because <laughs> that's just, that's just beautiful. That's funny. So I actually, when I went to San Antonio, I met up with Ian in San Antonio and uh, I wore that when I got there. So we went out to dinner that night, just kind of casually. And I just, I had my fire docket t-shirt on because it, it is one of those things. It's funny. And, and a lot of people feel that way, but really most of the people that have the energy to tweet, 
that kind of stuff, I kind of thinking, wow, there's some in some secret part of you, you must love him because you must love to hate him or something. So we just make a joke of it. It's just it's it's fun. So I got my fire docket shirt. Um, he actually started selling some more. We we actually a friend of ours prints him up now. He's he's like <laughs> we we were we were a little worried. We're like, wait, should we put that out in the universe or not? You know, the yeah. whole fire docket thing. But it's just a joke, and he never takes himself too seriously. I think that's what makes him uh, an easy target for some people because he kind of laughs along with it, you know. But he doesn't take it to heart. It's it's kind of fun, and it's part of the game. Right, and and I've you know. Always, anytime I interacted with him or when he came here to be on uh, ESPN locally, he said, if you ever need anything, I owe you a favor. So remind remind Dan that whether he's cooking for me or something out in Indy, he, he still owes me one. He's going to have yes. to Yes, he so. will definitely pay that back. He's good for it. <laughs> so with that being said, here with Lee Ross Dockage, and, and, and Lee, I, I want to get into collegiate athletics. You had reposted something on on twitter about you know for the love of the game and how you know it's gotten away from that or how you know parents want to reestablish that first and foremost it should be about the love of the game what have you seen in the world that we're in today and and how things have changed i mean like you said you've been in the ranks of coaching you've you've been a commentator on you know the sport of softball you obviously have been within universities and and seen things that are going on at all different you know athletic programs and whatnot how much have things changed in your opinion from when you got involved to where we're at where we're at right now oh my gosh I, I feel like you know I've seen the sports from all sides as a player as a coach as a, a parent as you know as an athletic director in a high school you know I've kind of seen it from all angles and and I it, the love of playing sports is we're losing that because I feel like the adults around all the kids who start playing have screwed it up for these kids. We've screwed it up for them. You know, my last few years, maybe like the last five or so years of, of coaching collegiately, I think the easy target is to blame the kids. Kids just don't get it. Kids, they're just not the same, you know? And I think that that I might've made the mistake by blaming kids and like, what? why don't they understand this or that? Or, you know, um, how to be competitive, uh, all of, all of the things that you learn, from playing sports growing up and it it's really not their fault i think it's it's the people all the parents and all the um coaches and all all the adults that have been surrounding these kids we've kind of we've made them lose the love for it and it's very rare to find kids who just love playing because we don't allow them to just go play you see it at the the young ages you see it at travel ball parents coaching their kids because they want they think they're doing right by their kid they think that they're making their kid a better player by helping them you know to learn certain skills and and really if you're sending your kid off to a coach to go play for let them go play for a coach and be on a team why don't you step back and be a parent you know and I think that it kind of starts there but then it's really with the whole travel ball and we've got all those people involved now you know it's it, and I understand the importance of travel ball and, and the importance of playing sports but we've turned this into a business for adults. We haven't allowed this to just kind of organically grow with kids, you know, and, and everyone gets to play. Well, there should be certain leagues for everyone to play, but a lot of these travel ball teams, especially for softball, they're making promises that they're not going to keep. They're right. charging an arm and a leg for kids to be on a team and making the promise that we'll get you a scholarship in college and that is absolutely not true for everybody you're not going to get a scholarship not every person is going to get a scholarship and you're not all going to play d1 and i've been trying to tell parents and and kids that for years but i think it's very difficult when you don't know the process you don't understand the process it's difficult to navigate it so they put their their money and their trust into a travel ball coach and if you think about being a travel ball coach, that's that's a business. That's a job. Like that is we need people to pay in so that we now can continue, you know, our team. So it's just this vicious cycle that has happened. It's parents looking to find that, you know, their kids the best possible chance for them to play at the next level. Travel ball coach is trying to supply that. Meanwhile, not really knowing the ins and outs of the process and just thinking that if they get kids and they schedule tournaments, then coaches will come and see them. 
you know, and really the ones who are missing out here who are losing out are the kids. The kids are just kind of being shoved around by these adults. Hey, go play here, and maybe we can get you a scholarship here. Well, through that whole process, a lot of kids just, they lose the love. It's, it's the discussion when they get home is, well, you didn't get enough playing time. Well, why is so-and-so playing here? Well, I pay the same amount of money as so-and-so, and why are you not getting, you know, that college coach was there. You should be on the field. It's really not enjoyable. And um, I'm really happy because the, the, I know lacrosse has made changes to their recruiting process, and I know that softball is now next. You know, NCAA softball wants to change um, contact period. They want to push that back. They want to make everything September 1st, junior year, like no contact, no nothing. I think the whole environment is going to change, and I don't know how yet, but I, I think it's going to be for the better ultimately. Yeah, and speaking here with, with Lee Ross Stockich about collegiate athletics and things that are going on. And Lee, you know, you bring up a good point that, you know, it is it is this vicious cycle of, okay, well, I want my kid to do this. And I've been around this before, you know, where, you know, okay, I'm going to coach my kid. I'm going to bring him up. I'm going to be there every second. I'm going to be hard on him. And, and unfortunately, you know, I've seen families where the father has, you know, coached the older kids, and then here's his last one. Here's the last of a, of a of a few kids that he's had, last of four. And this kid's kind of like, ah, you know, I want to play. I like it, but I don't. And the and the father just wasn't a father anymore. He just became a coach all the time. You better get out and practice. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And and didn't want the, this kid who at the time was ten years old to to live his life and to enjoy his life. It was all about training and practicing and don't you want to be better than your brother and don't you want to get somewhere and don't you want to do this and do that and it, it just uh, watching it and and that not being my child and me not being related to them it still broke my heart but you know at, at any sport at any level I mean I jokingly said something about it before you came on this morning but you know there's there's been USC looking at a kid who's 12 years old and saying you know we, we're gonna we're gonna send him an offer we think that in a few years, he's going to be a great quarterback in college, and we want him to play for us. And it's become so different that you can't really enjoy it. You can't have fun with it. And and I understand that parents want their kids to have a life and have things set up for themselves and be set for their future. But at the same time, it, it literally becomes a 24-7 business of – we need you to do this. We need you to go here. We need you to, you know, you got to be outside practicing right after you have dinner. I want you outside right after you do this. I want you outside. It's, it's become a different world. And for me, seeing it firsthand with some families, it breaks my heart to know that these kids really don't get an opportunity to live the life that they want to live. And it's always about the sport, but not about them, which creates some good athletes, but it also creates people that, aren't able to kind of function in society outside of playing their sport and that's it. Yeah. And I think, I think parents have great intentions and I think it, it's, it's, you want the best for your kids. And, and sometimes as a parent, we do too much because we're trying to make things the best for our kids. And I think that that's, you know, yeah. If you do say, if a child, if your child says, I want to play in college, then there is a level of commitment that that kid needs to make. And I could see a parent wanting to, you know, okay, you say you want to play in college. Well, let's go. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you. It almost becomes, you're just so worried about the end game that you're not enjoying the process. And, you know, that is sad. But, and again, you go, it goes back. I think parents are trying to do the right things. They just don't know. And I'm really happy that I had the experience of coaching uh, at the college level for 20 years and when my daughter, when it came time for my daughter to go through this whole recruiting process, I completely backed off. I, I never really, I didn't really push her. I wanted her to just play the game. I didn't want her to worry about well, where are you going to go to school, where are you going to go to school. Some Her friends, I watched her friends uh, worry about that and stress out about that. And through the course of stressing out, a lot of them, again, lost the love for playing because they were so stressed or they panicked and then they didn't really play well because they weren't really enjoying it. They were just more concerned about who's watching. Right. Um, or th even some of them commit early and then they really stop working after that point. You know, it's, it's just, it's such a hard process. And I, I'm glad I had the experience of seeing it 
on all sides because when it came time for taking, we'd go to camps. We wouldn't stress out about, you know, when you go to play travel ball, just be out there because you love playing. I don't, you know, let, let's not make it anything bigger than that. Let's not worry too much about, you know, who's watching. Um, but I knew as a parent, and I would always tell parents this, if you could save some of the money that you spend in all those lessons and all that travel ball, I mean, people, they get second mortgages on their homes to pay for this stuff. They're missing so much work and taking so many vacation days to travel to what, you know, that it's, it's like, it affects your entire family. If now there's a point, if your kid is one of those players, then you might have to do that. But most players are like average and they're going to be okay. They're going to be good. And maybe they can play at, at college level, but you don't have to put that much time, effort, energy, money in on the front end, you know, save some of that, put it towards their college education, put some away and then go to a coach to a school at a school where your daughter really likes to play or really loves the school and say, Hey, you know what? Scholarship isn't an issue for us. We're, we've, we've saved some money here. You know, we focus on academics. Our kid's going to get some academic money and, you know, we're going to be able to help out. She wants the opportunity to play, you know, start that way. I think in really, you've got kids that are committing, you know, Florida's got two sixth graders that have committed sixth graders. And they haven't even taken standardized tests. Like, how do we know how they're going to do in college? Like, right. we just assume because they're good softball players, they're going to be good students. You just don't know that. Um, if you can push back the the date where kids can actually contact coaches till junior year, well, now kids can actually be high school students. And now they can actually take a standardized test to kind of see where they fit. You know, I knew when Tegan took her standardized test, I knew what schools now we were going to attack. You know, she got a... 35 on our ACT. Okay, we're going to go look at Ivy Leagues. Let's go. You know, let's go out to Harvard. Let's go look at these schools and see if they're the right fit for you. We did our work on the front end. We didn't pay travel ball coaches all this money in hopes that a college coach would come and maybe catch a glimpse of a good hit here and there. We did the work. And that, and I think that that's, that's the hardest part. Parents don't really know where to start. And, and, and it's difficult to, to kind of guide them through the process because everyone thinks their kid is going to play in college and maybe that's not their kid's dream. You know, we're trying to decide that as sixth graders now. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, and that's, you know, that's really where, you know, where, where things have gotten crazy. And like I said, you know, I mean, seeing it at all different collegiate, whatever college sport it is to see it at the basketball level of, you know, looking at an eight year old and seeing somebody, like I said, throwing at 12 in the state of Texas and saying, well, that, you know, that's, that's going to be our future. And we've gotten some messages that have come in here. I want to get to a few okay. things here. So, uh, it, let me see what we got. So parents moving kids to other states, regions in other states to attend a power school. Now, let's address that a little bit that there's, and it's not just other states. There's, there's the, you know, kind of, you know, let's let's put down your aunt's address so that you can go to this school and let's tell every, you know, if anybody asks you, you stay with, with you know, Aunt Mary. So it's not just states. I mean, it's, it's inside the states as well that people try to kind of like redraw the lines of the district to have their kid go to a certain place. Yeah, and again, that's, it, it is, it's so, it's getting out of hand. I, I am just... I don't know if this is what the world has come to, but I know my parents aren't moving their house. They're not, I'm going to school wherever my parents live, period. And I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> and I, maybe I'm old school, but like for, this is what we do as parents and as adults, we make our children. It's like, of course we love our kids. Of course we want everything for the, our kids. But when they become the center of our universe, like the world turns upside down. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Children, that, and I think that that is a big issue in just the world in general, in the United States. It's just we make our children the center of the universe. And now when they become adults, they don't know how to function because they're not the center of the universe anymore. So we're doing this. We think that we're fulfilling their dreams. And really what we're doing is we're not we're not helping them become people, whole, you know, rounded, well-rounded people, understanding sometimes – you just take what you get. Sometimes that's what life is. Sometimes, hey, we live in the school district. Doesn't mean you can't still work as hard as possible, show that you've got this great work ethic and still, you know, do very, very well in sports. And you'll see, I feel like people panic and they're trying to make 
everything happen for their child instead of almost trusting build your child into a good human being like teach them how to be a uh, have a good work ethic how to be a good teammate how to um be responsible for their actions you know the, all of those things and then let things happen for them yeah you know and and that's and that that's the tough part and, and you brought up something speaking here with lee ross dockage on wake up call with dan tortora uh, about the fact of saying that's that a kid is the center of the universe okay that they're that they're everything and 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 there's you know people are going to parent the way that they want to parent and you know my parents loved me growing up and they also you know they love me now they love me then but at the same time my parents they loved me enough to tell me you know you're not the only person in this world the the solar system doesn't revolve around you when you get down on your knees to pray to god you're not looking in the mirror there's something above you so have the respect for that have the respect for people that are out there and go after and chase your dreams don't let anybody stand in your way but know that there's a world out there and you have to interact and you touched on the fact that you know kids these days they don't know how to function and when they're thrown out into the real world i mean i see kids together texting the person that they're hanging out with or texting a person that they're not hanging out with about how they want to hang out while they're hanging out with somebody else. Then they go hang out with the other person. They're texting that person they just saw like, hey, we should hang out sometime. It, there, it, it's, it's, so, it's, so in, it's so distant. It's, it, it's so impersonal now that it's, it, there's just no reality. And I feel like, you know, I hear it all the time with the businesses I work with that when they have young people come in, they don't know how to interview. They don't know how to dress. They don't know how to look you in the eye. They don't know how to stop using their cell phone. I mean, when I worked at Disney, if you pulled your cell phone out while working at Disney on site, on stage, they call it, you could be fired on the spot, sent back up to New York and have a great day. And, you know, that's what I grew up with was, you know, our customer services, you look them in the eye, you pay attention to them, you're here 100% of the moment, and when everything is done, and when you have a lunch break, or you're done with this and the other thing, you don't take your problems to work, you handle it when you leave. And it's it's just become, to me, it's become a different world. And it's not every kid, there's adults that do this too, and it's it's it's... It's not everybody in the millennial generation that I think gets a bad rap, but there is the the reality that there are people in our society that cannot function if it's not on Twitter, if it's not a text message. If you call them, they won't answer, but they'll text you for three hours. Like that, to me, is is a is a very large issue in our world. Yeah, and I honestly, boy, if we could solve the the world's problems right now, that'd be fantastic, right? <laughs> yeah. But I'm telling you, even you talked about earlier the the way things have changed since I've been coaching, since I started coaching. You know, when I first, when I was at Bowling Green, and I remember when cell phones first started becoming a thing, and I would before kids even got on the bus, they put their phones up in a box on the front seat. Yeah. You don't need. To, you're going to a game, and that what 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 over the years what happened and that was okay that was hey that's a coach these are our team rules right we have team rules well what happened over the years is well maybe one kid didn't like that rule so then parents would call in and say well we don't like that rule that's that's her property why are you taking her property and now you have an administrator that's got to listen because they're kind of handcuffed by parent you know you just don't want any waves so then as soon as one would complain then the next would and then the next would and then all of a sudden it's like we started becoming i this is how i felt college athletics almost the the people that you put in charge to coach are the people that were put in charge of our children you need to give them okay give them the trust of you're gonna teach them life lessons too okay well maybe a life lesson is we don't need to be texting everybody else. And, you know, you're on a, t on a bus with your team and you're heading to a game. How about if we talk about the game? How about if we work on, like you were saying, communication with the person next to you in the seat instead of being on your phone? Yeah. You know, so you were allowed to do that when I first started coaching. But then over the years, we just started bending a little bit and giving and giving. And then it almost is like, well, we just kept catering and catering to the wishes and the whims of these kids because their parents would complain. And I, I get it. Like I get, there are some things that maybe we used to do that was a little tougher and times have changed. And, you know, we have to adapt with the times and stuff like that. But 
there are things that I think make you a better human being. And one is communicating with other human beings. And, and you know, what, I don't, I think that makes you a better person. I think being involved and engaged in the people around you, it's just, that's part of life. And that's how communities work. And that's how we take care of each other. And we, and we know, you know, if someone needs something, that's how we do that. But we've almost caused this. And I, don't, I really, you know, I coach my daughter's high school team. And I've had to change a lot of things just because times have changed. And I get, you know, it's a different, whole different level. Like my livelihood does not depend on me winning the Zinesville softball game. But it, it's it's sad to see, but I've had to change my mentality. And it's actually, it's not as enjoyable because you don't, you're not allowed to teach life lessons anymore. You're not allowed. And, and I, we don't, I don't even know if we, if we all want, because life lessons are tough sometimes. And then we go back to, you know, our kids. We want want our kids to be comfortable and, and successful and never face any kind of adversity. Right. Well, you got to take out the life lessons if you want to make that happen for kids. And I think that we've kind of gotten to that point. And it's really almost sad that I don't know if we could ever go back, you know. And I think we just need to figure out how to deal with where we are now. It, you know, it, it, in sports, sports, especially women's sports, I always felt like, that was the organic. That's where kids still played for heart. They didn't play to try to get to the big leagues because it's women's sports. You know, softball, we have a pro league. Um, now it's becoming more and more of a business. But, you know, we I, felt, I feel like we've lost that charm of what sports, you know, sports was what taught kids how to be good human beings. Um, and I think we're losing that because we're making it into a business. Yeah. And, and the, the, the reality of it all is, you know, what I've learned in, in my connection with sports over the years, I played growing up. I had an opportunity in college for basketball to play Division three. I decided to broadcast instead. I followed that life. I don't regret it by any stretch of the imagination. I still love basketball, and I, I, I have a respect for every sport that's out there, even the ones that I've never played. And at the same time, you know, I look at – what I've learned since then as a broadcaster and the kids that I've talked to. And a lot of these kids, you know, mom's not around, dad's not around, and their teachers are their coaches. Their parents are their coaches. I can't tell you how many kids I've spoken with that have, from all over the country that have said to me, you know, such and such is like a father to me. And uh -huh. we can't lose that, Lee. I mean, I, we, we can't afford to lose – to the people that don't have a parent, a father, a mother, we can't lose the teachable lessons. But in a world, and 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 like we said, you know, it's it's hard to solve the world's problems, like you were talking about. But we've become. I, I try to try to find a, a nice, easy way to say this. For we we've become a world of everybody's big on social media, but when people are actually asked to step up. There's very few of us, a small percentage of us, that are willing to fight the real battles. And and that's sad. And for me, you know, to, to meet these kids and talk with these kids and hear their stories, this this is this is what they have. They they need these teachable moments, they need these lessons, they need somebody to give them that real love, that honest love, that hey, you're going down the wrong path. I don't want to see what's going to happen if you keep going that way. People that genuinely care about them, that aren't looking for a competitive advantage or a recruiting advantage or a monetary advantage or a business advantage or a promotional advantage, but just looking to help a kid out. And when we lose that, when we don't have that, because we live in a world where everything's PC and PC changes every day, if you want to give a teachable moment to a kid and you say, well, you know, I learned from God, and then their parent goes, hey, 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 we don't teach God in the house. It's very hard in today's world to take a kid aside and say, I want to help you out because you have to follow so many different politically correct terms and rules and whatever now, instead of just taking a kid to the side and saying, hey, what's going on? Let's talk about it. I'll tell you about what I've been through. You tell me about what you've been through, and let's figure it out together. Right, exactly. Hold on, Dan, one second. I got to say bye to Dan. Okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. See, now he owes to me, too. It's all good. Yeah, he's going off to work. He's got his three-hour radio. He says hello, too, Dan. Hi, Dan. How you doing? <laughs> but going back to the point that you just made, I I was just having a discussion with one of my friends earlier this morning, and, and the line that came out of my mouth was, who 
would want to go into coaching anymore. And that's what we've done. We've, we've made it so difficult for people to want to coach kids, like because of all of the dramatics and the, and the, the, everything that surrounds it and the hassle that you can't just go coach, you know, most people, most people that I've ever met, I've coached for, Oh my gosh, 30 years now. Yeah. No, more than like 25 years. I've coached for 25 years. And the only thing I ever wanted to do when I was, when I coached was to be around kids, to help teach them. I love the learning process. I love that part. Love to teach them how to be competitive, you know, be a good role model. You know, those are the things that was my intention. And I think most people that go to coach, those are their intentions, whether they're very good at it or not. It, we don't know, but you have to give coaches a break because most of the time they're just trying to do what's right. And they can't just worry about one kid. They have to worry about a team. Right. So I think that now the way society is, and mostly it's, it's all the lawsuits and the, you know, whatever the, the, um, accusations, um, bad communication, whatever it is, people just don't want to go into it anymore. And that's sad. So we won't have kids that are going to have good coaches because good coaches don't really want to deal with all the other stuff. They just want to deal with the kids and creating great bonds and teaching them how to be good at life. And, you know, we're going to play a game too along the way, you know? And I think that that's really, really sad that that is exactly the, the problem is good people don't want to do it anymore because it is a hassle. I, I, a friend of mine just, just this morning, her daughter plays 14 U travel volleyball league. Apparently one child was being, you know, a me player and was really whatever, whatever the reason she was asked to leave the team. It was that bad. Well, the parents are now suing and it's, this is 14 U and the parents are suing because whatever it's not even there's no reason to sue but that's what you're always worried about as a coach when I first started it was challenging kids to be their best so that we could go compete on a field and winning is fun competing is fun um and now it's just kind of turned into you walk on eggshells you want you don't want to offend anybody or, or like make the wrong comment you know your intentions your words can get twisted so easily intention so it, it's almost like a game that that you have to play in order to navigate and it just is exhausting so mm -hmm. it's it's sad actually you know I, I i heard on i think it was on um i saw like a video in some state they actually started a non-structured baseball league where these little guys would go out on saturday mornings they pick teams when they got there um, a 13 year old boy was the umpire behind the play. Basically what we used to do out in the neighborhood, right? Yeah, you yeah. just get, to, yeah, you get your neighbor. Well, so parents have organized an unorganized baseball league, which to me is silly, but at least they're getting the right idea there. No parents are allowed to coach it. No parents are allowed to yell from the stands. They're not allowed. They're not allowed. And I think they were, the bottom line was these kids were just out there having fun. Well, that's what parents should be doing around their neighborhoods. Why don't you go grab kids in the neighborhood? Let's go get a wiffle ball game going. Like, why don't you guys go and play in the yard? And if they get in a fight, they get in a fight. They'll figure it out. You know, like, don't try to meddle so much in what these kids are doing. We're not allowing them to be human beings by themselves. We're telling them how to do everything. Yeah. And, and it's essentially, you know, and, and we, we've had a bunch of statements that have come through here and, and listening to it, and I appreciate the comments about how people uh, essentially that that the kid becomes the way that they are because of the way that the parent is, and that's that's what they learn, and, and that's what it becomes. But but it is hard, and, and you bring it up, and, and it was brought up by a listener just now that it's not even about coaching, it's about officials too, you know, you don't... I know a lot of officials that have been in the game for like three or four decades and, and it is not, it's never easy to be an official. And, and I had, I had an official say to me, I mean, because now it's social media, I mean, my Lord, there's nothing good said, but one of the officials that I've known very well over time and, and you might know him from the community because, because he's from central New York, but Mike Kitts who coached college basketball forever, um, officiated college basketball forever in a day and did a bunch of final fours. He is somebody who told me, he said, you know, my hope as an official always when I was on the floor is that I would walk into the stadium and nobody would know my name 
and I'd walk out of the stadium and nobody would know my name. Because if I if, if that happened, then I did my job. But in the here and now, I mean, I, I coached I coached soccer. Uh, I did for when I was in Pennsylvania before I moved back to Syracuse. I coached a travel soccer league in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, and it was a YMCA. And and I've never told I, I don't I think I've talked about it on the show, but I know Lee, you and I have never spoken about this. I coached eight to eleven year olds. I came yeah. on and, and I told I, I basically just called it the y, YMCA. I said, "Hey, I've always wanted to get into coaching. Let me know what I got to do." I was broadcasting on ESPN at the time. I was like, "You know, this isn't a full time job, obviously, but I'd love to help out. If you got something, let me know." And the and the guy that was there said, "Well, how young do you want him?" I said, "Well, give me the youngest you got because if I'm going to stick around here, I'd love to, you know, coach him through." And so he said, "We got eight to eleven year old boys." I said, "Great, sounds good. Let's make it happen." And they didn't really tell me everything about the situation, but essentially one of the kids on my team, his father was the coach before. And the father taught the kids how to slide tackle and put your cleat toward the shin and knock a guy down and hurt somebody. Basically, you know, do what you can to win the game at all costs. And if you got to injure players and you got to injure people. Well, I had to unteach the kids that, and we lost some games. And so some of the kids started saying, you know, you're a bad coach because when we used to be able to kick players, like coach used to tell us, we were winning, and now we're not winning anymore, so we want to go back to that. And then there was a moment, and I alluded to it with one of the things that got written into us on the live line here, and we appreciate all your comments. I, I said that I was, I was threatened on the field. And essentially what this parent did, whose child was 10 years old, was uh, everybody came up to pick up their kids. We practiced at night. We finished practice at like 7 o'clock. They shut all the lights off. And, oh, I'm sorry, we were on the field that didn't have any lights. So once the sun set, we were done. So I was wrapping up. All the parents pulled up into the little dirt parking lot, picked up their kids. This guy stayed. He said, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. At this point, I was 22, 23 years old. This guy's 47, 50, somewhere around there, and old enough to be my dad. And, and he, he started to speak with me about all the parents, you know, I didn't want to tell you this, but all the parents hate you. They don't like you. They're sick of losing. They want to get rid of you. And I was like, is it the parents or, or is it a parent? And the more that we started to discuss what was going on, he got very close and there's nobody there. He waited for everybody to leave, got in my face. We're in total darkness. Nobody's going to, there's no witness to anything. And he was nose to, you know, nose to nose with me pretty much. And he said to me, apparently you don't know who I am. And I looked back at him and I said, sir, with all due respect, I'm half your age and I haven't moved. So apparently you don't know who you're dealing with either because as much as you've threatened me on my field for a half an hour, I haven't left, and I'm staring eye to eye with you, and as long as you want to be here, I'm not backing away. And I remember standing up that day and walking away from that moment being proud of myself that I wasn't afraid to stand there, but at the same time, I was like, this guy taught these kids how to hurt other kids that they're going to take with them for the rest of their life. They've attributed that to hurting kids equals winning, and then when his kid wasn't playing a lot, because in all honesty, his kid wasn't that good, and I had a lot better players out there, I got threatened on the field once everybody left, and it was pretty much like, if I stand here five more minutes with you, I might hit you, Mr. Totora, and it's like, okay, well, it's nice to know that this is what 11, 8 to 11-year-olds have to deal with when they go home, but I mean, it, stories like that are a dime a dozen, I feel like. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and, and really, uh, honestly... You hear that on both sides, you know, bad coaches, bad parents, bad players, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, sports are supposed to be used for life lessons, period. And and I think that when uh, people make it more than what it is and they become way too serious about, especially at that that age, like that's what you got eight to 11 year olds. They're supposed to be out there learning the basics of a game right (laughs) not you know not it's not about the winning part there I think we just all kind of you know once you start once you add winning into the process once you add like I've got to win I have to win then it becomes unenjoyable and it and things just get uh crazy you know people start focusing on the wrong things 
and basically, I mean, and that's, we can go around and around with all those stories. I mean, it's, there's a, a million of them. I've been shoved by parents, a, a woman coach shoved by a father, um, like with an elbow to the side and, you know, nobody at Syracuse, Syracuse people were pretty awesome. They were, I would just have to say that they were great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, because, um, I think that my, my hope is though, that, parents are starting to understand because I feel like the kids that I'm coaching now in high school, um, their parents seem like minded with me. You know, I feel bad for both of my kids because I never, I always will take a coach's side for every, (laughs) if they call to complain about something, I'm like, well, what did you do? You know, I need to know what they're, what they're responsible for. Well, what did you do? And sometimes I just need them to know, listen, you can't change things. Like, let's just focus on what you can do. And that is work hard because whatever happens in the long run, if you just work hard, you're going to be a great person in the end for it. Bottom line, don't worry about the playing time. Don't worry about the winning. Don't worry about who's in front of you. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what the coach said. Who cares? You work hard. You know, that's an arena for a kid to work hard and to prove, kind of build some character. And I think that that's we kind of, we have to get back to that, and that's what I'm kind of seeing now with the younger players, the high school. I feel like the parents, maybe we've complained enough about the way parents have babied their kids and coddled them. I think that it might be shifting again, which is a really good thing to see. It's really like, you know, we don't want these hardened kids like, hey, we don't care what you say, go ahead, you know, knock us down. But we want kids to understand that sometimes. You know, criticism is good. Constructive criticism is good, right. and you're not and you're not perfect. And we do want you to make a whole bunch of mistakes while you're young because you're going to learn from them and you're going to be better for it. So you know, just go out there and play to make mistakes. Go ahead, know that they're going to happen, and know you're going to mess up. And let's just move on and get better, you know, from it. So I think that that's kind of it. It's almost the conversation is exhausting of all of the bad things that have happened in sports and that can be happening in this, like this, like this little glimmer, this little bright light that I kind of seeing with some parents and maybe not all, but these younger kids, their parents are kind of hands off a little bit more and they're, you know, they're, they're letting their kids kind of fail a little bit, which is a great step because we stopped doing that for a while. You know, I always like, again, going back to my kids, I think because I was a coach, um, my children, and I think this was probably in their best interest anyway, looking back, I, you know, I, I kind of let them fail at some things and I let them, like, I, I, I didn't want to coddle them because I didn't want them to, to accept, expect that for the rest of their lives, for people to just take care of them. I wanted them to kind of be held responsible for things and, you know, and to understand it doesn't mean you as a person are a bad person or you are, you know, a failure. It just means Hey, so what? Okay. I screwed up or, you know, I didn't win or I failed and okay, move on. Doesn't mean that I'm anything different. The bottom line, I feel like kids need to have a little more control of their sports, what they are doing. They need to play it because they love it. They need to be the ones to call coaches if they're not going to be at practice. They need to be the ones that, that discuss the, you know, that have the discussions with, Hey, what can I do to get on the field? I think a kid has to have that discussion with the coach and then be able to listen to what the truth is. Well, you're not on the field because you're really not hitting right now. So you might still get opportunities, be ready. And if you get an opportunity, take advantage of it. And and no, that doesn't mean that you're bad. It means you're not playing, but you will get an opportunity, you know, be ready for it. And and it, it just, it is what it is. So I think if kids can have that in, Parents will let them take care of those things, and kids just worry about their effort. That's all they can control. Their attitude. That's all they can control. You know, we we're trying to make this. We're trying to make all of our children into superstars, and they're losing the whole reason for playing sports in the first place. It's not to just be a superstar. It's to learn these life lessons to build character. And, and to have that coming from Lee Ross Stockage and Lee, you know, in closing here, and like you said, we're, we're starting to see a change and see a shift. There's, there's a program in central New York called Building Men, and I was asked to speak 10 minutes away from Syracuse University, 10 minutes away from, you know, the fields and the Mellow Center and all that, 
and and I was at Danforth School and on the south side. And I mean, just to get into the school, you have to go, you know, it's a very old building, but you got to be buzzed in, let them know who you are, this and that. You can't just walk in. And, and just the feeling of going into that school and then walking up and down the halls and saying, you know, these kids don't have what I had growing up. They don't have the cleanliness of this. They don't have the safety of this. They don't. And I already was walking through those halls saying, I don't like this. You know, I don't appreciate this. These kids deserve better. I walked into a room of about 14 kids that stayed in this after school building men program. And they were anywhere from eight to 14. Uh-huh. Every single one of these kids, African American and, and looking at them, I, I, one of the things that I said because of the world, unfortunately that we live in today, I said, listen, I said, you can see a man standing in front of you today of a different background, different nationality, different color, but please understand that you've been punched in the face and so have I. Life has told me, hey, I'm here and I've had to go through that adversity, you know, and, and, and I think that the things that have built me that maybe won't, aren't, that aren't the same as what built you are still things that have made me better. And I asked the kids, I said, who wants to be a professional athlete? All right, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And I went around the room and basketball player, football player, basketball player, football player. And then one kid looked at me and he said, I want to do dirt biking. And I said, well, that's cool. And then the other kid goes, I think I want to be a broadcaster like what you're doing if I don't play basketball. And I said, wow. And then this other guy, this other kid, he said, I know I said football, but I, you know, I, I, I want to have my own clothing line. And I said, you know, I like that. I said, I like that. I said, thank you for thinking outside the box. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something today. I said, I am not telling you guys that you can't make it as a football player or as a basketball player. But what I'm telling you is that percentage is so small, and we all think that because, unfortunately, in the world that they live in, that's their way out. We make, you know, I play this sport, I make my money, I get my mom, I get my dad, I get my family the hell out of the situation that we're in. And I've met kids like that of all different ages. I want to I want to do what I got to do to make my money to get these people safe. But the thing is, even if you guys play, that's going to end at 29. It's going to end at 31. It's going to end at 35. And then we have to live life beyond that. We have to do more beyond that. And one of the most profound things when you talk about this world changing and you talk about our youth and something happening, some positive movement, something that I'm just only hoping has the hand of of God pushing it along, is I said to every single one of those kids in the room, raise your hand if you believe in God. Every single one of those 14 kids raised their hand. And I, I looked at my wife who was sitting in the back And after we got out of there, I said, you want to know the most profound moment? And she said, what? I said, when I asked those kids if they believed in God and they all raised their hands, these kids have every reason not to believe in anything. And they believe in the privileged people that have everything in the world and everything has been given to them on a silver platter. They they don't believe in anything bigger than themselves. They are the center of the universe. They are the greatest. Yet these kids who fight for everything that they have and don't go home to great households and great experiences and and some of them don't have good grandparents because they had spoke, they had they had said that to me and and don't have a great parent situation because you learn that from them these kids who had nothing to believe in and were forgotten by the rest of society and cast to the side they said you know no wait 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 a second we believe in god we have dreams we have aspirations and i thought that that was one of the most profound moments of my 32 years on this world is to see the people that are supposed to be the downtrodden and the forgotten say we have a faith we have hope we have belief and we believe that somebody's looking out for us to get out of the situation and and that that to me gives me hope for the future absolutely absolutely you know instead of i think there has to be an understanding where you have to understand that you're really not in control of your life. You're just here to kind of do the best you can and be the best person you can and always be improving yourself. And I think every one of us, but I think people, like you said, the ones that are privileged, I think that, that we have a tendency when, when people have 
things. They think that they built it themselves and they got it themselves. And so they rely on themselves. And I think that it doesn't matter who you are or which situation is, none of us are really responsible for any of that. There, you know, that's, it's not our own doing. And, uh, and so that is, that is fantastic. And, and I think that that's, it, it would be nice. We try to use sports. Everyone tries to use it and, and probably because of social media and just the way that the world has become, it's, it's so it's in our face all the time. So people try to use that as that's how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to get out of this mess or that's how I'm going to be successful. That's how, instead of using our own strengths and our God given talents, like I would always explain that to kids. It's what you, what you see in all these people that are on TV, what you see, you don't see the process. You don't see how they got there. You only see them enjoying this, maybe this extravagant life and being this unbelievable athlete. You don't understand that number one, they were gifted by God. Like they got some kind of a talent that not everybody gets. So you can't just make that talent. You can't just buy lessons and become that, you know, you can't play on a certain team and now you're going to be that athlete. And then there's a whole lot of hard work to refine those talents that go into it to get them to that point. So we all, most people, like you said, most people aren't going to make it there. That's not, that's not, that's what we see. It could be a dream. It could be it, but, but understanding your gifts, I think, and then honing your skills, the gifts that you've been given, that's where people are going to be successful. And we'll take the pressure off of these kids and spending all this money for these dreams that maybe shouldn't be their dreams, you know? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's just, you know, the reality of, you know, just, just seeing, like you said, and I, I loved, I love what you said when you said that, when you said they don't see it, they don't see the work that goes into it. And, and, and the kid's eyes widened in that room that day when I looked at them and I said, listen, I'm not you. And I said, I didn't grow up where you, where you're growing up right now. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I don't have the same life that you had, but I looked him in the eye and I said, if you think that somebody didn't try to lie, cheat, and steal my job away, my opportunity away to discredit me, disrespect me, my company, what I stand for. When I stepped out to do something original and different, I said, if you think that I haven't been punched in the mouth by somebody in this world multiple times and their eyes widen up like, how is this guy who's talking to us, what do you mean that you've had to fight battles? And I said, yeah, we all have to fight battles. And, right. and the battles that I fought... You know, I, t I, I say it all the time, uh, anytime we're doing entrepreneurship or business stuff, I say, you're going to learn something. And if you take nothing away from anything I say today, I always tell people when I'm t speaking to a class, there's one thing that you're going to realize in life very quickly. You either love what you do or you think you love what you do. Right. And there is a stark difference because when you get knocked down, when you get up, when you get back up, no questions, and you're like, okay, I got to do this again. You you're in love with that thing. When you get hit, and you're like, mm, I don't really think this is for me. You know, that's that's when you realize it. But I mean, Lee, it's there. There is a movement. There is positivity. There is something to be said about what's going on in this world, and 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 it's the greatest thing when you can go into a room of people and not have to be politically correct and not have to be this, that, and the other thing, but to just look at another human being and say, Hey, I don't, I haven't lived your life. I haven't seen everything you've, you, you've seen, but I'm, I want to understand your plight. I want to be here on your journey. And I, and, and, and when you walk out of a room to say, Hey, if you need me, you call me. If you need mm -hmm. some, let's talk. And you know, if we write off society and we write off the future then why do these kids feel like they owe us anything, that they owe the world anything? It's when you say to those kids, if you need something, my hand's going to be here. Because what they experience at 7 years old will affect 14, will affect 21, and so on. So I want the future of the human race to know that sport or no sport, whatever's going on, whatever dreams you have, that there's people like Lee Ross Dockage and there's people like Dan Satora that are like, hey, if if you want to learn and you want to you want to be a part of something and you want to grow, we'll be here to to outstretch our hand. If you slap it away, that's on you. But I don't think that this world gets any better if we don't if we take our hands away, Lee. No, exactly, exactly. And it's but it it, it is sad. Like I had said, I this will be my last year coaching. Um, Tegan will graduate. She's actually 
she'll be going to Harvard next year to play softball. So I am kind of like really excited for now to enjoy watching them yeah. do their thing. But there still is part of me that wants to take like little, say nine year olds, little athletes, and I just want to start training. I, I don't know why. It's just it's what I do. It's what I love. And I'm like, okay, I don't really know any of these kids, but I feel like in this area, I know eventually I won't be able to stay out of it long, just because, just to see, you know. And I think people don't understand that when when you're when you're a coach, you love to see kids succeed you love to see when they learn a new skill you love it it's it's like makes your whole day and i think that would probably be the next step that i'll do i'll probably take a few years off and you know just keep doing the espn thing and and um watching my kids finish their careers in college and then i'll probably get back into it and just start training some young kids again (laughs) well that's the thing you know in in closing here i mean lee it's it, it it's in you and and i think that you know that's it's something about the world of sports. I said it's one of the last things left in the world that will bring bring total strangers together, and and it's the coolest thing. I said you could sit down in a bar, watch a game, guy sits next to you, you don't know him, he doesn't know you. You start cheering on a team, he starts cheering on a team. You hear him say something that you've been saying for the last three years, then all of a sudden you say, "Hey, I'm Bob. Hey, I'm Tim." Bob and Tim start talking. Hey, I'll see you next week. They come yeah. back to the bar. Three years later, that's the best man at your wedding. That's what sports can do. There's exactly. there's that beauty exactly. in that world of it. And and I know you're a coach and I'm a broadcaster and a writer, but, Lee, we both have fallen in love with the same type of thing because we know that the vehicle of sports, you can put a bunch of things in that car, and, you know, we use we use the sport as a vehicle, and then we pack the car up with all this good stuff, and we hope that you know we can impart some of those morals and values and 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 positive you know affirmations from doing sports. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, at least I I, I learned something today. I learned that there's another good person out there that's continuing to work hard. So I appreciate <laughs> well, what thanks. you're doing, Lee. So <laughs> thank you. And you know, it's good to have that. And that's what I'm about on the show. Is like if we bring up something that's tough to talk about or a little bit negative you know or the things that are kind of you know going on with collegiate athletics to find a positive and to spin it to not you know to not just talk about the problem without a solution right exactly so i appreciate your time i appreciate having you on and i think that all this has done is make me want to have you on more often so you're gonna have to find some time for me lee (laughs) all right sounds good dan my pleasure (laughs) all right take care have a good day Uh, all right bye-bye take care that coming from lee ross dockage once again uh, having her on the show here, uh, didn't anticipate having her on here for, you know, an hour, but uh, you, you know, we're talking about what we're talking about, and, and this stuff is important, and it means a lot, and it goes a long way. So, you know, for me, I I really do appreciate her time, and I appreciate the fact that we're talking about positive things, and I want to thank all the, the thoughts that we got, and, and uh, Melinda, who, who put out put a ton of stuff on our timeline. Uh, I want to thank all the, uh, you know, everything that you said. And, and Melinda brought up a lot of good points here uh, that we can tackle as we go. And I just appreciate you listening and being a part of the show. So, yes, folks, things are broken, but they're not unfixable. I don't believe anything in life is unfixable. I don't believe that there's any country or any people or any anything that, you know, can't figure out a way to get along. And, it, you know, it just takes understanding. It takes respect. And it takes knowing at the basis of everything that you're dealing with another human being. And if you didn't want somebody to talk to you this way, then you shouldn't talk to them that way or treat you this way. Then you shouldn't treat them that way. It's funny, but Thumper from Bambi had it right. What did your father teach you is what Thumper's, Thumper's parents said. And he said, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And maybe I would change that just a little bit and say, if you don't have anything nice to say, figure out something nice to say and learn how to be a positive person. Because the world, we have problems, folks. We have problems. You look out your door, we got problems. But guess what? If we keep looking out the door going, oh, we got problems. We got problems. We're not going to get any better. You know? If I look outside and say, wow, the grass is getting pretty long. I should probably cut it. And then I don't cut it. The grass is always going to be long.
if we look outside and say, wow, the grass is getting long, honey, but we don't cut the grass, the grass isn't going to get any shorter. And that's just like that with the problems that we have in the world today. We can talk about how there's problems, but if we work on nothing and we make no solutions, we will always have problems and we will always be looking outside at the grass that keeps getting longer and longer until it covers the windows and we can't see. So cheers to cutting the grass together, folks. We'll take a step aside and come back with Through the Looking Glass in just a moment. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 315- 487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. The Penn and Trophy Center on 111 East Willow Street in Syracuse, New York, has been making memories for Central New York for over 60 years. It has the trophies for your teams, and when you walk in there, it's so much more than just that. When you walk into the Penn and Trophy Center, you are immersed in the reality that anything can be customized, anything can be engraved, whether it's for your anniversary, your wedding, your bar mitzvah, your birthday party, whatever you want to do with that memory, that watch from grandpa, or that bracelet from mom, or that wedding ring that's been passed down through your family. If you want to get something engraved with a memory to last a lifetime, the Penn and Trophy Center, 111 East Willow Street in Syracuse, New York, where memories are made and where memories last a lifetime. Hi, this is Kira from Looking Glass Events, where we're always giving you a reason to celebrate. Whether you have a small business, large business, personal event, or a wedding, we are available to plan and coordinate your dream event to life. Every detail, every step, Looking Glass Events is working with you all the way. Call us at 315 315- 702-4653. That's 315-702-4653. Or contact us through our website, lgweddingsandevents.com. Looking Glass Events, giving you a reason to celebrate. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on wakeupcalldt.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on mixlr.com backslash wakeupcalldt. Very happy to have you here every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Folks, I appreciate your time very much so. And as we always round out the show with, and we're doing a little bit later today, but that's because Lee and I got talking about a very profound and important conversation. In all honesty, the conversation kept opening doors and windows that I didn't want to stop it. You know, there was a lot to be said there, and it and it means a lot to me. So thank you to Lee for spending some time And everything that she had to say. So it definitely means a lot. And to wrap up today's show, going from one profound woman to another profound businesswoman here in the community, Kara Wasserback, 315-702-4653 is the number to call. That's 315-702-4653. And... If you're planning an event, when you're planning an event, leading into your event, make sure you don't waste a moment. If your event's two years away, never too early to call. 315-702-4653. That's 315-702-4653 for Kira Wasserback and Looking Glass Events to help to let them help you plan your next event. And we always do every Thursday at the end of the show through the looking glass proudly brought to you by looking glass events a deeper look at a trending topic and we do it ad lib folks on the fly 
because that's how I like to live. My comedy's on the fly. You know, I like being quick witted and being able to, you know, just kind of take what God gives me and roll with it. So we look at what's going on today. So here's a deeper look at a trending topic. There's a bunch of them. Let's go to the first one. It's National Grilled Cheese Day, which only makes me think about the fact that Tom and Chi never made it to Syracuse. Tom and Chi, we need you. We miss you. We love you. We never had you. Oh, my gosh. Tom and Chi is like Darius Baisley. They were supposed to come here, and they never did. Too soon? I think it's too soon. But (laughs) anyways, National... It's true. National Grilled Cheese Day. Tom and Chi. Oh, my. They're macaroni and cheese inside of the grilled cheese. You have the 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 barbecue inside of the grilled cheese with the potato chips. It literally is like the crazy concoctions I came up with in my life that I was like, hey, mom, I'm going to do some weird stuff with my sandwich. And she's like, okay, you're crazy, but I love you. And that's what Tom and Chi does. So, you know, Tom and Chi, please come to Syracuse. I know it didn't work out in Camillus, but there's other parts that you could come to. You know, maybe you could set up down the street or something. We'd love to have you down the street here from the studio. Tom and Chi, we miss you. We never had you. We hope we get to have you soon. And and if you come here, well, then we won't have to miss you and Darius Baisley. So we'll see what happens. Outside of that, Jeff Hornacek was fired by the New York Knicks. I think the New York Knicks, the only thing that they're good at lately in basketball is firing head coaches. But besides, <laughs> besides that, there's not much. They fired Jeff Hornacek, and I asked you what your thoughts are. We're very early in the polls here on Twitter. Make sure that you vote at CallDT. I put up polls every single week on Twitter. So if you follow me just to answer the polls strictly, you're going to have a good time. At CallDT, C-A-L-L-D-T. Go there and follow me. Click on follow on Twitter and answer my poll questions. A couple of them up right now. New York Knicks fans, what's your reaction to the hire, to the firing pardon me, of Jeff Hornacek? You have only agreed or strongly agreed. No one's disagreed or strongly disagreed. No one has disagreed at all with the firing of Jeff Hornacek. You either love it or you like it. That's what we've gotten so far. We've gotten a mixed bag with Orlando Magic fans, though. I said, what's your reaction to the firing of Frank Vogel? 11% of you strongly agree. 33% of you agree. 33% of you disagree. And 23% of you strongly disagree. So if I take the agree and strongly agree to, versus the disagree and strongly disagree, 44% of you agree in some way with the firing of Frank Vogel from the Orlando Magic as their head coach. 56% of you disagree in some sense, either strongly or just regular disagree. So the the disagreements are winning. And here's the thing, you know, and this is why you put up polls when some people are like, oh my God, I hate when you put up a poll about blah, 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 when everybody knows the answer. Really? Because I put up the poll thinking most people are probably going to tell me that they're happy that the Magic have fired their coach. Wouldn't that be fair to say that most of them are are happy that they fired their coach? Why? Because the coach didn't win a lot of games and there wasn't a lot of success, right? So somebody could tell me, Dan, why'd you put up that poll? The Orlando Magic are in 15th out of 16 places in the Eastern Conference. They won 25 games out of 82 tries. Of course, everybody's happy the coach left. Really? 56% of you disagree with the firing of Frank Vogel. Putting it out there. So that's another deeper look at a trending topic. And something that just happened. Jarvis Landry coming from the Miami Dolphins. If I, you know, I do a lot of impressions. And if I could do a Dolphin impression on command, that's one that's like, it's really hard because you got to like, you know, it's like, it's not, I don't even want to like entertain it because it's fair. You got to like click and make this weird noise. It's not easy to do. So I'm not going to mess around with it. Whatever I just did, that's good enough. Just be like, hey. Dan was getting ramped up for it. That was good stuff. Jarvis Landry is deeper look at a trending topic, proudly brought to you by Looking Glass Events. Ecto Cores is like, try it. No, I'm not going to do it. Because I because it's so hard to do. Because I don't even know how to do like Flipper, where it's like, where it's like, ah, ah. It's, it just sounds like I'm laughing. It's not, it's just not. I don't want to do <laughs> I did find out that I could do Cleveland from the Cleveland show. Speaking of the Cleveland Browns, and I'm like, why is everybody mad at me? They all think that Jarvis Landry is going to be a great player. Well, I think he is too. Shoot. So, but, but I mean, like, I'm excited for Jarvis Landry to be with the Cleveland Browns because the Cleveland Browns have made some good moves. I'm not sitting here being like, hey, I'm a giant Browns fan. 
Not at all. I just really, really like what the Browns have been doing. They just signed Jarvis Landry to a five-year, $75 million contract. $47 million guaranteed. Almost $50 million guaranteed. Hello. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Jarvis Landry getting that hefty contract. Let's take a look at where Jarvis Landry is at in his career, uh, shall we? So, he's signing a five-year contract with the Cleveland Browns. He's played for four seasons in the NFL, played 16 games every season with the Miami Dolphins. They didn't, in, in, as far as in the regular season, then the postseason, he only had one game in the postseason while with the Dolphins in 2016. He has never missed a game. God bless him. Knock on wood and a God bless and well wishes moving forward. And prayers for prayers for continued health. Four seasons, sixteen out of sixteen games. He has never missed a game, and he played the only playoff game that they've had. Sixty-five games he could have played, and he played in all sixty-five. He's going into his fifth season, so his five-year contract with the Browns. He's young, right? He's young and he's healthy. He's young, he's healthy, and he could have been a number one wide wide receiver. So I feel like he he's one of those guys that could be like the number one or could be the number three, depending on where he's at. It's like he either makes it happen or could like fall off a little bit. But in the last three seasons, he had 1,100 yards in 2015, 16, 1,100 in 2016, 17, at least 1,100. He had a little bit over. So he had 1,157, 1,136. Last season he had 987. So not too shabby on that either. Dealing with a different quarterback, and you got to think about that. He was 13 yards away from having 1,000 yards for three years in a row, and he didn't have his starting quarterback. He had Jay Cutler, who we all know is not that great. So, at the quarterback position, not saying as as a person. So, Jarvis Landry did more with less this past season and had almost 1,000 yards. And then, you know, we look at this, just what he's done in his career as a rookie, 758 yards, then 1157, then 1136, and 987 112 receptions last year. With all the woes that Miami had and not having their starting quarterback, Ryan Tannehill, before the season even started, to go through everything they went through in multiple quarterbacks, he caught more passes than he's ever caught in a season, and he had almost 1,000 yards. So if that says anything about him, and he had more touchdowns than he's ever had in a season. He had more touchdowns this past season with all the quarterback woes in Miami Jarvis Landry had more touchdowns, nine, than he had in the last two seasons combined, which was eight. So this man, as a receiver, is directly affected by his quarterback, and he, by numbers, looks just as good, if not better, than he usually is when he has his starting quarterback. I would think that that shows you that you got a damn good player on your hands, and obviously Cleveland thinks so, because five years, 75K, or 75K, 75 mil, is gonna is gonna be this contract forty seven million dollars guaranteed and five years means that he would be nine years in the NFL and I think that that's that makes sense you know if you're if you're given a five year contract to somebody that's thirty four thirty five in the NFL people would go you know they probably question it but I mean here's a young man who's done some great things and he's twenty five years old and he's got five years that'll make him thirty and he's been healthy God bless him and you know like I said. I pray and I hope that continues for every player that's out there trying to do their thing and, and everybody that's aspiring to do their thing. So Jarvis Landry taking a deeper look at a trending topic during the show just got that massive payday. And by, like I said, by his health, by what he's done when he's had a good, when he's had his quarterback or when he's had to deal with a backup quarterback, with everything that he's dealt with, he has stayed healthy, he has stayed relevant, He's helped out fantasy owners for what that's worth. So I give Jarvis Landry a lot of credit. He's done a great job, and I think that you know his payday is wonderful. I think it's surprising to people because Miami wasn't that good, but I think Cleveland might have stumbled on a really awesome guy. And I really hope that his numbers continue and that he can help Cleveland turn the corner and finally get them back into the playoffs and make them a, su- a successful team again because I just want to see that. And then Jay Wright, there's this conversation that the Knicks are after Jay Wright. If I'm Jay Wright, I'd keep my Cooley and Villanova. I'm close enough in Philadelphia. I can wave hello. But I'm staying 
in Villanova. I'm not leaving Villanova. Heck no. Why would I? I've won two championships in three years. I've made the NCAA tournament every season I've been in Villanova except for one. I'm extremely relevant. The Big East is relevant again. It's not a power conference. It's not an autonomy conference. Yet it's damn good again. Villanova's damn good. And I have all the respect in the world for Jay Wright. And if I'm Jay Wright, why would I want to go to a team that, like I said, the only thing that they've done good in the last decade is fire coaches. And they haven't even done that well all the time because they seem to not always, they keep a coach a little bit too long, so to speak. So with that being said, thank you so much for listening into the show. And thank you once again to Cam Lynch as well as Lee Ross. Thank you to Looking Glass Events for Through the Looking Glass and plan your event in central and upstate New York with them today. If you live in the state of New York, you need to make a phone call. 315-702-4653. And speaking of another company I'm blessed to work with, Utica Pizza Company, had dinner there last night with Pops, and your boy's heading back there again because Papa hungry. So I am uh, going back to Utica Pizza Company. Head out there yourself. 628 South Main Street in North Syracuse, New York, right by the Sweetheart Corners. God bless and have a great day. Twitter, at CallDT, answer the polls. Facebook, at WakeUpCallDT. Instagram, at WakeUpCall underscore DT. Everything's on WakeUpCallDT.com. You are amazing. Download the app. We're almost at 102,000 downloads for shows. Go to WakeUpCallDT.com. RSS feed, iTunes podcast, downloadable app powered by Podbean, over 750 shows on any one of those outlets. Also on TuneIn Radio, Player FM, awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. And tomorrow's show, the Annoying Moment of the Week, proudly presented by Carvel DeWitt, starts off the show like we always do at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Significant sound bites with Syracuse, Orange Men's Basketball alum, and CNY Pop Festival guest coming up this August, Howard Trish. And then in the second hour of the show, we are doing fantasy football and NFL and all that good talk with Mike Sofka. I'll see you then, and I love you much.